order. Uh, can you please call the roll, Megan? Chairman Beck. Present. Senator Birdwell. Senator, Senator Hinojosa. Senator Huffman. Senator Nichols. Here. Representative Hunter. Here. Representative Langraff. Here. Representative Menares. Present. Representative Sherman. Here. Mr. Babcock. Present. Judge Jamison. Here. Chief Justice Jefferson. Here. Ms. Liberato. Here. Mr. Oliveira. And Chief Justice Phillips. Here. We do have a quorum. All right, we clearly have a quorum. Uh, I Senator Hinojosa here, if I may. Oh, Senator Hinojosa is present. Okay. Yes, All right, our next Senator item. Huffman is present also. Okay, Senator, Senator Huffman, Huffman is also present. So let's, let's uh, Megan, make sure we uh, reflect in our minutes that they're present. Have that, yes. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is the adoption of the minutes from our November 13, 2020 meeting. Uh, those were sent out earlier. I assume everyone's had an opportunity to review those. Uh, all those in favor of adopting the minutes signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries and the minutes are adopted. Okay, that brings us to the uh, primary reason for today's meeting. Uh, we circulated a draft report earlier and it still needs uh, considerable work. Uh, I know I'm in the process of editing it. I know that uh, other commissioners have sent me emails making suggestions uh, uh, for the draft report and those will certainly be taken into consideration. Uh, so just please be advised that there'll be another draft of the report going out after this meeting, uh, not just to show what we've done historically uh, with respect to the commission's work, but also whatever recommendations we come up with today. So ju just please know that there's going to be another draft that you'll have an opportunity to comment on and, and edit. Um, this is actually our last scheduled meeting and hopefully based upon what we accomplished today, we will not need another meeting. But again, depending upon what happens today, uh, we may need to schedule a meeting, uh, albeit a shorter meeting between now and the end of the year. But I just wanted to kind of alert the commissioners to that. Okay, I think as we all know, our mandate is to study and consider the uh, various methods of judicial selection, and then subsequently to make recommendations to the governor and to the legislature. Uh, in addition to the meetings of our three subcommittees, we have met, uh, it's hard to believe this, but we've met about 14 times since our appointment. So I want to thank the commissioners for their dedication, uh, for their attention to this important assignment, and yes, even for your perseverance, because I know that uh, sometimes going into a lot of this historical data can be quite uh, tedious. Uh, we have uh, come a long way, in my view. And today I think we need to develop our recommendations and that means we'll have to vote and we'll have to vote on specific issues. Um, at uh, Senator Birdwell's suggestion, we really came up with a list of eight basic issues which we circulated earlier this week. And these are the issues I think we need to address. And as you may have noted from the document, many of those have multiple subparts. So answering the eight basic questions will undoubtedly trigger a discussion into some of these subparts as well. Um, and as I said earlier, the final report when completed will be circulated for your final approval. And that won't come until sometime after the meeting. So if you look at the eight basic questions we have, you'll see that the overarching uh, issues uh, are, are how do we improve our judicial system? Uh, how do we make certain that our judges are highly qualified? How do we encourage those who wish to be judges uh, do so? Uh, how do we, to the extent possible, get money out of our judicial system? Uh, how do we ensure the integrity of our system and avoid in the public's eye the appearance of impropriety? Uh, these are the type fundamental questions that I think we need to address in our discussion. Uh, and one footnote I wanna add, because this comes up quite frequently in my discussions with commissioners, and that is that I assume that everyone on the commission is in favor of grandfathering in all of the judges that have been elected under our current system, regardless of whatever 
recommendations we come up with. So unless somebody objects to that, uh, I'm just going to assume that we're all in favor of grandfathering because I think it's important that somebody who's already gone through our process and been elected uh, uh, is entitled to serve their full term, assuming that we make a recommendation that's different than our current system and assuming the legislature moves forward in that regard. So with that backdrop, uh, let's turn to the first question, which is, do we recommend the continuation of our present partisan judicial selection? So let me kind of throw the uh, floor open to discussion and um, let's uh, let the games begin as they say. <laughs> Chief Justice Jefferson, did you want to begin? Uh, sure. Um, and first of all, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and all the commissioners. Uh, when I was first appointed to this commission, I didn't know what uh, would transpire. And uh, what I witnessed was just an amazing, um, amazing contributions from each and every one of my fellow commissioners. Um, uh, from their perspectives and all uh, committed to making sure that our judicial system works for the people of Texas. And I've, I've just been very proud to be part of this process. Um, I want to answer the question, uh, the first question uh, in this way. Uh, we do need to change our system. Uh, and the context for me, at least, and I don't wanna make this overly personal, but I, I've, I've been uh, on the ballot uh, several times uh, in 2002 after my initial appointment, in 2006 after I was appointed Chief Justice, and in 2008. And so I've seen uh, the way these elections work for uh, judges and judicial candidates. And it's, um, it's not pretty, but, but politics is not pretty. Uh, more importantly, it's not illuminating to the voters in the end. Um, today, judges can be elected um, even though no one knows who they are. And, and, and I know this because after my 2002 election, I conducted a poll and uh, the results were that 82% of Texas voters had no clue who I was. I mean, just not any idea at all. And so they vote not based on the person or their experience or merit, but based on uh, party affiliation, which I think is a poor standard for judicial competence, or they vote based on the sound of your name. Um, my name was a good one, Wallace Jefferson. Thank you, mom and dad, for you know that name because it worked on the ballot. Um, but it also, it, it also depends on how much money you have and whether you can get on TV and radio and mail and travel and all of that. Um, and all of those have nothing to do with how good as a judge you would be uh, when on the bench. Uh, and today judges can be elected even though they've never ever tried a case or argued an appeal or, or even deposed a witness or didn't done any litigation whatsoever. Um, and I just wanna remind us all and the public that the cases that are before these judges are literally involving life and death or the care and custody of our children or disputes about the lifeblood of our economy, our energy industry, or about water rights, or our public schools. Um, so we need um, competent, capable, smart, intelligent, hardworking people to serve on, on the courts to resolve these important issues. And the second thing I think, um, and Chairman Beck, you mentioned it, uh, money, money plagues our system, lawyers, and litigants give money to the judges who then rule on their cases. And the public is rightly concerned that those financial contributions influence winners and losers. And they don't think that's right. And I don't think it's right. I don't think it happens very often, but uh, the appearance uh, to the lay public is devastating to the concept of a rule of law. And then I'm, I'm going to finally say, because I don't want to take up too much time, and I know we have a lot to do this morning, but um, whatever process we choose, uh, I want to be clear about this. The best judges do not let party affiliation play any role in their decisions. And that's not to say that we can eliminate politics in any system that we recommend to the legislature or that the legislature may choose. 
uh, but we should come as close as humanly possible to minimizing its influence. We want judges who disregard uh, political affiliation, they disregard the financial status of people in front of them, uh, and they rule instead on what the rule of law is, and then you know should be judged, um, you know, by how they perform that solemn obligation. And and I think our current system is not meeting uh, that test. And so I would I would say that we uh, we should not uh, recommend that the status quo be maintained. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, any other comments? I'll make a comment. Senator Nichols. Uh, uh, I appreciate uh, the comments that were just made and I appreciate the work that the commission has done. You've been very thorough in your approach. You've been very fair to make sure everybody has their comments. Uh, I've, I've learned an awful lot uh, that I was not aware of, but I will tell you the, I, I represent 19 counties and 110 cities and the problems that you have in the high density urban areas are not the same kind of problems I have in my district. Uh, we do know our judges, we see them. Uh, we see them at chamber, we see them at Rotary clubs, we see them all over the place. Uh, they go to the auction barns, we, we know who our judges are. Um, and so I cannot in all good, judgment uh, support not electing the judges. So we're looking at taking away a constitutional right that our people have. Uh, and we, I listened very carefully on the partisan versus nonpartisan. And I've concluded in my own personal judgment that the system uh, that we currently have works very well in my district. And I cannot vote in any manner to change that, including A through E, under question one, which is really question two. I don't think we need to add more stuff to the ballot. Qualifications, yes. I do think uh, there have been some great points made on the qualifications. Uh, I probably am not the best person. There are other people more qualified on this panel to know what those qualifications should be than I, but I agree we need to increase the qualification. So I don't know how, uh, you would ask me to vote on all these other things when I'm, I'm I just want to make sure on the record that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be voting to stay with the current system of partisan selection, but I'm open to and uh, encouraging us to increase qualifications on the judges. So that's my statement. Senator Nichols, Senator, this is David Beck. Uh, just a question. Would you be open to considering a change in the system for the larger metropolitan areas, which of course, as you point out, are maybe different in the rural areas? I don't know how you can bifurcate our judicial system in the state, because as we're seeing in the redistricting process, uh, you, you know, the, the population densities are evolving over time. What used to be urban was much smaller. Now, geographically, it's reaching out into the adjacent counties, like in the Harris County. Uh, I've got uh, several counties that used to be rural counties that are now urban counties. And so I, I don't know how you would do that. I think we discussed that somewhere along the way. Uh, but I do agree you have a different kind of a problem in the urban area uh, than we do in the rural. And I have brought it up with a lot of the constituents I have. Uh, of overall walks of life. And when I told them they were even considering taking away their constitutional right to vote for the judges, uh, they really are quite offended. And I don't care if they're Republicans or Democrats, they just think that's an important right. Uh, so I don't know how you would separate it, but um, I agree that we need to be electing more qualified and that the people in the urban areas, they don't know who they're voting for. Um, I hope I answered your question. You did, thank you, Senator. All right, uh, Senator Huffman. Yeah, I'd like to uh, follow up on uh, Senator Nichols' comments, which I actually agree with everything that he said. Just wanna add a couple of items 
to his thoughts, since my district, of course, is different than his. Mine's unique in that I, in fact, do have urban and represent some of that the issues that we've discussed in Harris County. I also represent some of the suburban areas, but also I have rural areas down in Brazoria County. And I would agree exactly what Senator Nichols said about uh, how the rural voters um, might feel a little different. Though I have to say, um, I have not encountered folks even in the urban areas who are wanting me to take their right away from electing judges. So I think it's a fundamental right. Uh, I will also be voting to keep partisan elections. I do understand the issues and I sign on right now. In fact, I'm drafting a constitutional amendment to increase judicial qualifications and I would love to work with the commission on their recommendation, many of the experts in this group about what they think would be a fair approach and what would be uh, the right the right place to, to stop and um, on these uh, increasing uh, qualifications. I understand raising money and some of the, the campaign finance issues involving judicial uh, offices. I do think that's something we need to work on as well. Um, I'm very, uh, it's very obvious to me that there are concerns about the judges that are being elected, but I think it's going to take more voter education, more qualified judges, um, and us all working together. I do not believe the citizens, my constituents in the state of Texas want this right taken away from them, and I'm not going to be in a, in a position or be the one who does that. So, and again, I mean, it's been an incredible uh, commission here. Mr. Chairman, you've been Fabulous. I've sat on a couple of these that address the same issue, actually, and I've sat on many commissions during my careers, and this has just been run in such a wonderful way and so thorough. And I do believe that all the information we gather in any report you produce will be extremely uh, useful for the public and any experts who want to con continue to look at this issue. So thank you very much. That's my position. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Menhiris. Good morning, Chairman, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your leadership and also to thank my fellow commissioners for all of their hard work um, over all of the meetings that we have. And I just want to echo, I, I'm the same sentiment as, as Senator Nichols and, and Senator Huffman. What I will say is I, I too have major concerns uh, that constituents have relayed to me. They do not want to have their right uh, taken away from them to vote on, on the judges that they want to serve. Um, on these benches. In particular from Bear County, we heard, we had a public hearing and, and overwhelmingly, a lot of the witnesses uh, really testified against taking away the right to vote. Um, in addition, I think we need to be very careful about the notion of treating different jurisdictions and areas differently from one another. We need to be fair, whether it's urban and rural, but I think there's meaningful, real meaningful change that we can do. We can definitely visit qualifications we can definitely visit the campaign finance reform. So there are things I think that we can do to make real meaningful changes to the process. But I must echo the same sentiment as my fellow senators who just spoke about constituents really concerned and not liking the fact of not being able to vote for their judges. Thank you. Uh, Lynn Liberato. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, thanks to everyone else too. I, I, let me start by saying that I certainly agree uh, with everything uh, that uh, Judge Jefferson, Chief Justice Jefferson said, except to a degree with his conclusion. Um, I'm concerned and I suspect that others, regardless of how you vote, are concerned about the timing of this. Uh, in the last two elections, we've had um, uh, uh, primarily, or, or to a great degree, uh, women of color elected. And I think to change the system now when they have um, uh, followed the rules and played the game, uh, cast doubt upon even the best of motivations. Uh, and as a lawyer, uh, I've known and, and, and felt the, the, the problems with our current system. But one thing that struck me throughout is that every system has flaws. And in, in listening to the great presentations that we've had, um, I, there's not been a system that, at least in my estimation, was compelling enough to change from the elective system, at least at this time. I think the work, although I know we've been doing it forever, I think the work's begun. I think that 
certainly qualifications and other things we've discussed are ripe for changing now, but I have concern about the perceptions that are created if we wholesale change the partisan election system now. All the systems have flaws, uh, they're just different flaws. Yeah. Uh, Lynn, listen, uh, let, let me ask you a question. Sure. If, if we go forward and continue our partisan election system, where you have judges running as Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. when would there ever be a time for change? Well, that's, that's a good question. And it's a hard one to answer. Um, one way I'd answer it is I don't think the time is right now, immediately on the heels of uh, these other elections. It may be five years, it may be 10 years, um, uh, but I, I just don't think it is now. All right, uh, thank you. Any other you. comments? Senator Hinojosa. Yes, Senator Hinojosa. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and y'all have done a great job. I, I was very happy, very pleased uh, from the different testimony and, and witnesses that testified. I uh, learned a lot more about the different methods and systems that are in place in other states. Uh, but, but I'm part of the same page uh, as Senator Hubbard, Senator Nichols, and Roseanne Harris. In, in a sense, uh, there are issues with the present system that we have in place. Uh, but I, I would not vote to do away with it. Uh, I think we can make some adjustments and changes that would improve it to minimize uh, the swing that we get in partisan elections, uh, to minimize the influence of money, uh, to maybe increase the qualifications, uh, maybe even change some of the terms that they, uh, they serve. Uh, but the reality is when I looked at all the other systems, uh, as, as a previous member talked about, that there are some, uh, they all have flaws. I, I don't know what is best for Texas. I know that what we have right now there are issues and there's some uh, real serious problem that we need to address, uh, but I certainly would not uh, uh, consider doing away with it uh, um, as it exists without, uh, I could make some changes, but I couldn't vote to do away with it. Thank you, uh, Other comments? Todd Hunter would like. Yeah. Representative Hunter. Yeah. I'd like to make a comment a little different than what everybody else is talking about. One, I think we should continue the commission. Two, I, I have been conferring with groups like the League of Women Voters for many years on this issue. It's important and it should not be shelved. Three, we've gone into other areas than the process. And fourth, I think we need more public input into this system and fifth, I'm still not sure of the economics of changing the system, which is could impact the legislature. But I want to tell you, David, and all of you, you know, I, I've enjoyed this and I think it's very, very good. But let me make these comments. I'm not going to vote yes or no on your action items. And the reason is, unlike most of you, the Texas House has new members. The Texas House will have a new leadership program. And I do not want to be in a position of binding Texas House leadership or members. And so taking votes in December and the House is organized differently than the Senate. And we have different changes than the Senate. So on action items, I will be abstaining or passing because I don't think it's the right time until we're sworn in as legislators, the new leadership team is in place and committees and the house and the rules are finalized. So I have a mechanical issue and I would urge my house members to provide you their response and input but I think it's a great concept. I think we, I don't think the work uh, is over. And I like the analysis, but I have a problem voting in December. And because of the coronavirus, I think we have impacted and slowed down a lot 
of public input into the system on all sides. And so I want to let you know how I'm proceeding, but I do think it should be continued. I think the analysis is good, but to bind today on a system process or procedure, for me as a House member, I think that is premature until the legislature begins. And I'd urge my House members to give you their reaction because they may have difference of opinions or an agreement. Uh, Representative, let, let, let me ask you a question. Um, I mean, as the author of H, H House Bill 3040, um, we're ordered to submit our recommendations and report by December 31. What do we do? Uh, I mean, if, 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 if you are not willing to vote, right? Uh, uh, I mean, how, what do we do here? I mean, we, <laughs> Well, David, welcome to the legislature. Uh, when we passed the bill, we didn't know about coronavirus. When we passed the bill, we didn't know what the election results would be. And when we passed the bill, we didn't know there would be a leadership change. So we have three different events that occurred. I think you have a lot of support for different concepts, but I think certain things happen since the passage of the bill that handcuffs some of us. It's not that we don't want to vote yes or no, but some of us have constitutional and public responsibilities. Unfortunately, the timing of a lot of this uh, it just has not timed well. And so it's not avoiding, it's with these changes that have occurred, which has it, these have all happened since 2019. I think a lot of this uh, has impacted on how we proceed, especially on the budget and the appropriations. We didn't know about it at the time this bill was signed. So I think there's a lot of circumstances that changed, but I have no problems continuing if allowed. I have no problems with the concept and the analysis but an action item, I'm gonna be very forthright and upfront. It's hard for me to bind house members, bind a leadership team, uh, and with the public being impacted with coronavirus, uh, none of us, I think on the house side, knew this all would happen. And then the budget issue impacted because of the coronavirus. So I think there's some justification uh, that holds us back on being clear on a system, because I'm not sure right now if the feeling, the concept has changed since 2019. Okay. And I'd, I'd encourage Brooks uh, and, I, and Carl to give their views, to give you their sense of the Texas House uh, on how they perceive it. Let me be clear, Is it? would you recommend that part of our report include a recommendation that the commission be continued beyond December 31, 2020? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll recommend that. <laughs> okay. All right, any comments uh, by any other members of the House of Representatives? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative Lansgraf. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for all of your hard work and leadership throughout this process. Uh, I have to agree with my fellow commissioners who uh, you know, regardless of how we uh, feel about uh, recommendations that the commission may make, uh, I think we can all agree that the process, especially uh, amid all of the challenges that this year is, uh, has presented to us, uh, I think we can all be proud of the process. And that's uh, thanks in large part to your leadership and, of course, all the support uh, that we've received from uh, the great team at, at the Office of Court Administration. Uh, let me address a couple of items here. Uh, first, just to... Uh, uh, elaborate a little bit more on what uh, Chairman Hunter has has mentioned. I agree that there are some concerns uh, for those of uh, those of us commissioners who are also legislators, particularly those of us who serve in the House, uh, that there there are some issues given the transition that we're going through uh, about whether or not we can vote in December and then have to go through a uh, process. Uh, it, again, when there would be some other obligations that we would have uh, within the chamber. So I, I certainly understand where Chairman Hunter is coming from. I guess even among the House members, I'm in a slightly different uh, 
position in, in that in 2019, during the last legislative session, I actually authored and presented a legislative proposal that's been a large part of what we've discussed uh, uh, during these uh, during this series of commission meetings. And so I'm I'm effectively already on record for uh, promoting some sort of judicial selection reform. And, and I do want to talk about uh, uh, that since uh, since this appears to be a, a good time to do so. There, it's very clear based on some of the comments that we've already heard this morning and really throughout the year that uh, although it seems like we all have some concerns with the status quo in the present system, uh, we seem to lack consensus about the best way to move forward. Uh, of course, what I've presented in the past is a, an initial appointment uh, selection. By the way, I, I agree that anybody who has been elected under the current system uh, should uh, should be able to uh, enjoy the benefits of that. And Chairman Beck, you and I have had some discussions about that. I think uh, whatever recommendation is made, we cannot do any harm to any member who has been duly elected uh, to the to the judiciary in Texas. Uh, and so I, I think that, that part is very clear. But as far as what we would replace a partisan election system with, uh, th there are obviously different opinions on that. I hear my fellow commissioners talking about the importance of maintaining the right of the people to vote. And I think that that's absolutely crucial. And even in the proposals that I've made in the past, uh, the right to vote is not taken away uh, because that is a fundamental uh, part of judicial selection in Texas. Uh, and, and I think that is a component that absolutely uh, would have to be preserved uh, in the event that any change is made. Now there would be, uh, in what I've proposed in the past, an appointment uh, process to uh, uh, to initiate that so that we don't rely on um, all of the pitfalls that come with a partisan election process. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go on too long here this morning, but I, I guess the bottom line that I would want to convey is uh, while we do have some difficulty in coming uh, in agreeing uh, or at least having a consensus on what would come next, uh, I think it is important for us to lose or to not lose uh, uh, sight of the fact that a partisan uh, election process uh, is clearly flawed and, and we need to uh, continue the work to find a, a better replacement in a way that preserves the right of the people, that protects the right of the voters, uh, but also uh, allows us to uh, focus more on the qualifications of the judiciary and having um, and, and preserving experience and, and uh, maintaining a high degree of accountability without just relying on a very flawed uh, partisan election process. And so um, anyway, it, it's very clear that we probably don't have consensus, but I think uh, just because we can't all agree on what comes next doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue um, our pursuit of that uh, because what we have now is clearly flawed. And I think uh, I think we can all agree on that. And, and so I think that uh, regardless of, of what recommendations we make, uh, we do need to continue to find a better way because that's what the people of Texas deserve. Thank you, Representative Landgraf. Uh, other comments? Members of the Chairman committee? Beck. Yes, uh, Representative uh, Chairman. Chairman Beck, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your sober approach to this process. Uh, as the non-attorney to this committee, uh, to this commission, uh, I found it extremely interesting and insightful. But also, uh, as uh, the only non-attorney on this commission, uh, I found it uh, extremely uh, concerning uh, when we consider the voice of the voters should be heard uh, in this process. I too, first of all, want to say uh, that I feel uh, that we should continue uh, this discussion, continue the commission work. Uh, the judicial selection uh, process, I believe, fundamentally is a democratic uh, system or should be built on the bedrock of democracy. The voice of the voter, in my opinion, should never uh, be diminished uh, because of their zip code. Whether urban or rural, uh, the voices should be uh, heard and never tampered with. Uh, because the decisions of the voters is not deemed prudent uh, by those of us who uh, have been selected by the voters. So 
there's irony, irony there to me in that we feel obviously after a victory uh, in the election voter turnout that the voters were obviously smart when they chose us. Uh, but uh, those same voters uh, are not considered uh, wise enough to select uh, who, their who their judges are uh, based on uh, the demographics of those areas. So I, I'm a bit concerned about that. Uh, I think, again, that fundamentally the voice of the voters uh, should never be excluded uh, from this process. And uh, going back to something someone said earlier, you know, uh, we could cast uh, doubt uh, on our voters by simply making this change or considering making the change uh, when the representation on our judicial bench has uh, shifted dramatically uh, from male to female. Uh, and uh, more specifically, from white male to African-American female. And so uh, with that, uh, I cannot support uh, changing at this time the process for uh, judicial selection. But again, I do believe to answer your first question, uh, whether or not we should continue, uh, I think that we should, uh, because obviously a part of our democracy is that we must acknowledge that we can always improve uh, our system. We can make it better. Uh, so those are my comments, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Sherman. Of course, as the only non-attorney or one of the few non-attorneys, you, you bring great wisdom to our commission. So thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, Chief Justice Phillips. Uh, yes, I, I don't expect I'm gonna change any minds, but I do wanna say a few things in response to what uh, we've heard this morning. Uh, first, uh, the party that perceives itself behind has always wanted change. Uh, when I first uh, ran for judge, uh, merit selection was part of the Republican Party platform, and uh, uh, their state officials, state party leaders, routinely came to the legislature and testified for that. Uh, then in the 1990s, uh, the House passed a nonpartisan bill uh, on virtually a straight party vote uh, with Democratic support. Uh, and in 2003, every Democratic senator but one voted for Senator Duncan's uh, point elect retain uh, program. Uh, after 2018, Republicans suddenly saw the wisdom of uh, some other system. 2020 was a more mixed result uh, with the 13th Court of Appeals electing Republicans in all those races. So it seems to me like not a bad time. And also the statewide vote was pretty heavy for Republicans. Not a bad time politically uh, to take a look at the system. Uh, as to the idea that our district courts ought to all be treated the same, they're not treated the same now uh, because almost all of our larger counties have specialized district courts, criminal civil preference uh, courts, Counties that have specialized courts could easily be, I think, treated different from counties that don't. And as the specialization changes, the uh, election system could change. I'm disturbed by the comment that democracy requires, you have to have the system we have now or else it's anti-democratic, un-American, whatever, uh, because so many of our, elect our judicial elections are unopposed. At, at the time I left the office of Chief Justice, 40% of our district judges had initially been appointed and had never had an opponent. That, has, that number has certainly gone down, but it's still very high, particularly in the rural areas. And a retention election uh, would force every judge to face the voters at the end of every term. And to the extent that you believe that process makes a judge more polite, more punctual, uh, uh, more attentive to the office, which there's some studies that it, uh, that judges are nicer to jurors and witnesses uh, in the year preceding an election. Uh, the fact that every judge would face the voters 
at the end of every term would enhance that part of the democratic process and would certainly keep judges from serving their whole career without having a stated opponent. It's not easy to have a December filing deadline 13 months before you're to take office. Uh, it's not easy for someone in a rural area or a single district judge district uh, to make that kind of race. And so those races are so frequently unopposed. Uh, fourth, I, I do think the notion that voters have studied every candidate is just not borne out by the data. Uh, Jane Bland got defeated in 2018 in the Court of Appeals. In 2020, she became the highest vote getter in the state of, in the entire history of Texas. And I think she was still basically the same person. Uh, it was just a different top of the ticket. So, and finally, I do think we have to make some kind of report, even if our vote is four to three with 11 abstentions, uh, and that report can say we'd like to study it again. But um, we do have a mandate from the last legislature, uh, which I think we're obliged to follow. Uh, I think that we ought to look at qualifications now. It's the one area that everybody has uh, an agreement that something needs to be done. And, and we've heard a lot of testimony. And uh, I, would, I would like to see us work on that uh, rather than just personally one by one talking to various legislative sponsors. Uh, but I do think for those who believe in the partisan system, uh, for those who believe in an open election, uh, looking at what Illinois and Pennsylvania have, and New Mexico, the, where you uh, where you run in a partisan election to get your job, but you run on a nonpartisan yes or no ballot, and you always have the opportunity for the voters to to uh, grade your paper, uh, is a compromise that is is worth this group looking at. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, I have a comment, Chair, Mr. Chairman, but I'll yield to Senator Birdwell. Sorry. I, I think Charles beat me to the punch, Mr. Chairman. So I, okay. <laughs> whichever order you wish to go. Why don't no, you go I'll, first? Since you have I'll, a yield to the, I'll yield to the Senator. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, let me, uh, uh, let me, just add some thoughts given that I'm, I think I'm the other non-attorney uh, that, uh, that that's on the commission. Um, there there's, I don't think there's any doubt of, of my concurrence with Senator Nichols, Senator Huffman. Um, and uh, I, I did not catch all of Senator Hinojosa's, but I, I, I think uh, with him as well, I, I, it isn't just about a voting right. The Declaration of Independence is still original law and has not been annulled. In fact, uh, Article 7 of the U.S. Constitution brings it forward as original law. And it talks about, I mean, it's our vision statement, and it's what talks about the consent of the governed. And one of the reasons our nation has, I think, the, the divide that it has right now is that um, much of the application of what we live under has come from a judiciary a federal judiciary that is outside the bounds of its Article Three structure. Because we live on the consent of the governed, not the consent of the appointed. And that's what's so, I think the biggest cautionary tale, given what we've seen in judicial activism at the federal level, that is the, the buffer up against which this commission is operating. So understanding that, uh, let me first, uh, or, or second, I should have done it first, compliment you, Chairman Beck, as I think you know, I, I was one of the no votes on even having this commission because I think the, the, the nature of what I just said, it was my biggest concern with even broaching the subject here. You have dealt well and fairly in a difficult circumstance with uh, members of the legislature, members of the judiciary, members of the public on this commission. Um, I, I, I want to express one thing as well, that when, and, and Justice Jefferson starting us off was absolutely appropriate, but I, I think you could take the things that Justice Jefferson said 
and apply them to the other two branches of government as well. Uh, what he said, what, what he posited also applies, you know, about not knowing the, the candidate or the qualifications. While I'm in my district, and, and, and that's certainly a tougher challenge for a statewide judicial officer than a, an executive statewide uh, officer, um, I certainly have people that vote for me because of my party affiliation that don't know me, particularly given the growth of my district since I first initially ran. Um, the legislature makes life or death decisions as it relates to the personhood of an unborn child. What are the penalties that we determine that are, are death penalty or capital offense cases? Uh, we too deal with the, the questions as it relates to um, uh, money and, the, and whether it's interest groups, lobby or otherwise. So while Justice Jefferson explained these are the things that, that cause concern in the judiciary, they are the exact same things that cause concern in the, in the legislative and the executive branches, uh, but we're not considering appointing members of the legislature or the executive branch. Um, so I, I think uh, uh, I too won't vote to remove the ability for the, the ultimate customer here is the citizenry of the, of the state. I will not remove, I won't vote to remove that ability of the customer to make the decision of whom they wish to serve them. Because ultimately, whoever you choose, you know, you live with the results of, of who you've chosen. Um, I do also agree that the qualification question is one that I think that uh, that we can agree that there needs to be additional work done there or additional study. How is that done? Uh, uh, Senator Huffman has sent me uh, my office her uh, constitutional amendment that will, uh, with her judgment and experience, help uh, uh, potentially answer that question. Um, but otherwise, I, I it, it's kind of what like I think Justice Phillips said that we may have you know five or six votes and eleven abstentions. Um, I'm not sure how we do that. I, I only dealt with that on one vote in sunset, Mr. Chairman. I didn't, I didn't deal with that on as many votes as, as you have before us here, but, um, but that's why this has been, uh, a good learning lesson, but it's a tough one. Um, and with that, I uh, yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, Chip Babcock. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would be totally remiss if I didn't uh, add to the chorus of praise for our chair. Uh, I know how hard your job is uh, having chaired some other uh, unruly groups like ours. Uh, and so uh, I certainly appreciate your work and, and frankly, uh, getting to serve with all these other uh, people, uh, some of whom I know and some of whom I've just uh, uh, just met through this uh, commission. It's uh, it's, it's a terrific uh, collection of Texans. And uh, I hope that at the end of this process, we'll <clears throat> find something that will improve uh, the justice system uh, in Texas. Uh, I, I think I, I will join uh, uh, Representative Hunter and uh, Representative Landgraf in uh, suggesting that as hard as we have worked, uh, I think the pandemic uh, has uh, impeded and frustrated to a degree uh, our efforts uh, to collect data uh, that can inform our decisions. Uh, I think we have done some uh, work, particularly the San Antonio Bar did a, a terrific job for us by surveying a number uh, of their members. Uh, we have heard from other uh, groups. We've heard from national groups that have presented us with some uh, data. <clears throat> but uh, we also should not be uh, influenced by uh, uh, data that is not rigorous. Uh, I know that I've talked to, like many of our members, uh, to, to citizens, to people, to common people uh, out there. And if you phrase the question to them, do you think it's a good idea to take away your right to vote for your judges, uh, the decision or, or the response you get is almost 100% no, uh, I don't want you to take away my right uh, to vote. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know that that is the 
question that starts and ends the discussion. The, uh, we should have more rigorous look at, uh, well, wait a minute, are you in favor uh, of lawyers uh, contributing 90% uh, of the money to our Supreme Court justice races and big businesses like insurance companies and uh, big law firms uh, uh, contributing money uh, to your judges uh, that you're voting for? Well, no, I'm not in favor of that. Uh, well, that's what uh, you're getting here. Do you know your judge? Well, no. Uh, do you know any judge? Well, no. Do you know who Chief Justice Jefferson is? Well, no, I don't know that either. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, we could uh, use more analysis. That does not mean uh, that we can't, and in fact, I don't think we have a choice, uh, but to fulfill our mandate uh, that the legislature has laid down, which requires a report from us at the end of this process. I think that report should include uh, the fact that this needs additional study. Uh, I would not be in favor of telling the legislature either house uh, that they can't try to work on this important issue in the meantime, uh, but uh, this is something that is too important uh, to leave with just anecdotal uh, evidence. Um, the question of taking away the right to vote. Uh, I think that uh, certainly is a, uh, uh, is a issue of enormous consequence, uh, but, uh, and I'll, I'll take issue with a little bit of what Senator Birdwell said about the, the federal system. Um, uh, most lawyers, uh, trial lawyers will tell you uh, that by and large, uh, the, uh, the quality of justice in the federal system uh, is very high. Uh, I don't think you, you get much of a disagreement uh, about that uh, from litigators. Part of it's money. Uh, the judges have staff, uh, more staff than, than our uh, judges have uh, typically. But there's also uh, something to be said uh, for the federal system. And, and uh, Senator Birdwell, uh, we saw an example just within the last few days uh, of an independent judiciary, the Supreme Court, uh, which had three recently uh, appointed members uh, nominated by the president uh, vote uh, conclusively and quickly uh, against uh, the president's uh, position, uh, frustrating apparently what he thought they would do uh, and he was unhappy about, but that's because they're independent. And why are they independent? Because they've been appointed and are removed from political pressure. That's an extreme example, but it is one thing that argues in favor uh, of removing this uh, from partisan uh, elections. Uh, I would point out that on the issue of voting, uh, we are one of very few states that has partisan uh, elections. I think there may be three or four that do it uh, the way we do. Uh, but having said all that, I'm not for removing the electorate uh, from this process. But I do think we will solve a lot of our problems uh, if we basically make a tweak uh, to what we're doing. Uh, we've seen statistics, it's in our report, our draft report, that says that the governor appoints most of the judges, and then they quickly have to run uh, for election before the voters. Well, what if uh, the governor, uh, the governor uh, nominated, and then with some consent uh, of a commission and the legislature, uh, that person was put on the bench, and then after a period of time faces the voters in a retention election. Will that remove money from the process? No, it won't, but it will greatly reduce it. It will greatly reduce it. And that person now will have a track record that they will run on. And maybe the people voting for, for that uh, judge will know a little bit more about that judge, especially if that judge, that judge's uh, performance has been uh, unsatisfactory because if the performance has been unsatisfactory, that can be made, made known and would be known, I would suspect, uh, by the people practicing in front of that judge. Uh, the idea of a commission, I think, is a good one. 
Uh, I think a commission, uh, if it, uh, and I don't think just one commission, I think a commission that would handle uh, the Supreme Court, that would be one statewide commission that would, uh, would rate uh, A, B, or C, highly qualified, qualified, or not qualified. And that should be taken into account uh, by the uh, governor in his making an appointment and by the legislature in uh, approving that appointment. Uh, I think there can be a commission that would cover uh, the, the area covered by the Court of Appeal Justice that is being recommended and on down uh, to the lower courts at the, uh, at the district level. Uh, if we had a system like that, we would not be taking away people's right to vote. What we would be taking away would be their right to vote every two years for people they don't know in mass over and over again in a crowded ballot. That's all we would be taking away. And we would be taking away in many instances, people that had been appointed in the first, uh, in the first instance. Uh, we have qualified, we have apparently some consensus about the need to increase qualifications. Uh, I'm in favor of that. And I think everybody on, on this commission is as well, but that is a distraction. That is a distraction and, uh, and basically an alternative to tackling the hard problem of how we select our judges. And we are the commission on judicial selection, not on judicial qualification. Uh, that's something we should take in mind. And no matter what we do on qualifications, there will be unintended consequences. If we make the bar too high, we will be cutting out uh, constituencies that need to be represented on the bench. Uh, if we make it too low, we haven't done anything. Uh, so there are uh, flaws uh, in doing that. But to me, uh, it's a little bit uh, of a sideshow. Uh, I'll close by uh, agreeing uh, with Representative Meneras uh, and, um, uh, and Representative Landgraf that, um, I think it was Representative Landgraf that said um, that, uh, it, no, it wasn't, it was somebody else. but. Uh, we ought, uh, it was Representative Sherman, uh, the voice of the voter is not diminished because of the zip code. Uh, I agree with that, uh, Representative Sherman. Uh, we, uh, if we're going to have a Texas solution, it ought to be a solution for everybody. We ought not to carve out uh, the so-called uh, rur rural areas, uh, because today's rural area is tomorrow's metropolis. Ask anybody in Williamson County. Uh, or Fort Bend County, uh, or Collin County, uh, that. So uh, I've gone on too long. Uh, I think, uh, I think uh, our charge uh, is to resolve this thing. Uh, I think we can resolve it in a way that will improve immeasurably uh, the system of justice uh, in our state. And more importantly, and most importantly, it will address what I believe to be widespread distrust in the fairness of our system. Not that our judges are bad, not that they're corrupt, not that they're dishonest, not that they are influenced by the money, but the fact that the people, a lot of people think that they are. And that perception is gonna corrode our system in the years to come if we don't fix it. And we have a chance to fix it now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chip. Uh, let me weigh in at this point. Go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I just wanted to speak up briefly in response to Mr. Babcock. Uh, I agree with him and what others have said uh, as well about we need to treat all the state the same. But in particular to this concept of that if we somehow have an appointment system that then requires a vote by the folk, by the people for a retention, that that satisfies the process. And I feel like I, I want to speak up briefly part of what is unfair in my book about that process is it exempts or leaves out a whole class of individuals who might like to be a judge and who cannot be part of the process because they will never get an appointment. That they, they don't have either the political contacts, the background, something's wrong that makes them not the type of person that's getting an appointment. I think we leave those people um, behind if we go to an appointment system with all due respect to any governor or any commission that's making these appointments. 
Um, if you have the qualifications and the will to get your name on the ballot and work hard and try to get elected, then by God, you should have that right. I think about the young uh, uh, African-American women in Harris County that someone recently mentioned, one of the representatives. Yeah, they have a right to get out there and try to win and, and the people elected them. I think of myself many years ago when I knew no one, had no contacts, didn't know the governor, knew no one, but was a former prosecutor with good experience. And I got out there and worked that county, it's a big county, and worked it hard for a long time and got elected in a tough primary. So there, there are opportunities out there, this is America. And I think by going to an appointment system, we leave behind a large group of people that wanna to work to be elected. I just wanted to speak up for them. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, let me weigh in at this point um, and, and let me uh, be clear. I am a user of our current system. My clients are users of our current system. Some of my friends and some of my friends' clients are users of our current system. And one of the biggest concerns that all of them have, including me, is the absolute appearance of impropriety. Because when you have somebody running as a judge, theoretically, they are neutral. They don't, they, they're going to call balls and strikes. They're going to just listen to the facts and apply the laws that exist. Well, they're running as a Democrat or they're running as a Republican. And they're saying, vote for me because I'm a Democrat. Vote for me because I'm a Republican. And then suddenly they're elected and that doesn't, it's not supposed to mean anything anymore. I don't know how you convince the users of the system that that doesn't mean anything particularly when you have some candidates that are saying, if I'm elected, I'm not going to grant motions for summary judgment. Uh, well, the law, uh, if the, the law and the facts are there, a judge should grant summary judgment. But yet that's the type of position that appeals to a particular segment of the Bar Association. Uh, and, and so uh, it, it, it's, it, it's not that people won't get a chance to vote. As I understand um, all the evidence we've heard, every state is different. Every state is a product of their history. Uh, and when, when you, as all of you have, looked at our draft report and you see what some states have, uh, I mean, I would never be in support of anything like some of these states' uh, procedures. They're a product of their history and the problems that they've had in that given state. When you look at our current system, the fact of the matter is a, a substantial percentage of our judges are initially appointed by the governor. Uh, and then eventually they've got to run, I think it's in the next succeeding election, so that the people get a chance to veto up or down that judge. Well, my question, and by the way, in, in my view, um, that appointment system where you have a governor, Democrat or Republican has worked reasonably well. I, I think both governors uh, have appointed people that, that for the most part are very qualified and have been excellent judges. But the problem to me is, we're losing really good judges, as Chief Justice Nathan Heck said, and it has nothing to do with their performance. Uh, we lost a judge here in Harris County uh, who probably tried more lawsuits than any other uh, judge uh, in the courthouse. He was defeated. We had another judge who was widely reputed to be one of the brightest judges we've had. He was defeated in the primary. One was both of them were Democrats. Uh, and, the, and I'm not saying that the people that beat them aren't going to be good judges because we don't know that. But the fact of the matter is when somebody is brand new with no experience and replaces somebody with considerable experience, who bears the burden of that? Uh, the litigants in their court. It would be as if somebody retains me to represent them. And then suddenly I say, I'm out, but I've got a new associate who's going to handle your matter. Well, there's a learning curve. Uh, and as a consequence, it's the litigants that really bear the burden of that. So uh, in, in terms of, of what our current system is, um, both Democrats and Republican governors have appointed judges with subsequent elections. I do know that, that uh, one of the reports that was submitted to us earlier, and I think it was the Texas Civil Justice League who did a statewide survey. Uh, and as, as uh, Chip Babcock mentioned, it depends on how you frame the question. If you say, are you willing to give up your right to vote to elect judges, you're gonna get 100% of the people are gonna say, no, absolutely not. But I know that the survey that was run by the Texas Civil Justice League, as I recall, 
um, asked whether or not you would be in favor of letting the governor appoint as long as you had citizen panels that had direct input in who that judge would be, and then you had a subsequent election. And my recollection is that a solid majority was in favor of that. So it really depends on how you, uh, uh, you, you frame the question. And absolutely, I mean, I think we can all go to the parapets when we're talking about the right to vote. It's a cherished right that people have in this country, but it's an uninformed vote. That's the problem. It's an uninformed vote and it's providing consequences that really affect all the litigants and users of the system. So I just think that that's something we need to bear in mind when deciding how we go forward. So with that little speech, I'm gonna see if anybody else wants to comment at this point. Mr. Chair? Yes, Judge. Uh, again, thank you and thanks Megan also for, um, uh, for one thing, for getting so many interesting people to come and testify to this committee. I think the idea, and I believe it was probably the legislator's idea of getting their constituents to present their comments, um, I think were very, very helpful to us. I will, and thank you uh, for putting together, and I believe it was Senator Birdwell who wanted uh, these questions to be presented. I think this is a very um, thoughtful, nuanced list of questions. I'm a little bit disturbed, disappointed, I guess, that uh, several of the commissioners have seen any answer to number one as, uh, as, as a, any change at all would be to take away the, the, the citizens' right to vote, when I think there are very few things in this document that would imply a permanent uh, uh, first of all, I don't know how we could do it without a constitutional amendment. So I think that uh, the commission and the presenters have thought through the difficulty of, you know, quote, taking away the, the right to vote. The issue is how or when that right would be deployed, whether it be in a nonpartisan election or whether it would be following a, uh, a nomination from some kind of a, uh, a nominating committee. Uh, that I think could be well balanced um, to take into account. Uh, Senator Huffman was talking about persons who might not otherwise uh, be brought to the attention of say the governor's office of appointments, but might uh, want to run anyway. Um, so I would like for folks to kind of take a step back from thinking that that's a be all end all. Um, that if we don't do it in partisan elections the way we do it right now, that that is in effect taking away the right to vote. Um, I would like to also see this document. Um, you might want to make a few more edits or tweaks to it. I'd like to see this included with the report that we submit because I think it uh, would enable uh, the governor of the legislature to see um, kind of uh, the beginnings of a crystallization of um, some options that uh, the state the state might have. Um, I also want the commissioners to remember that Texas is an outlier. Not very many states in the union select their judges just the way we do. So we're either brilliant or maybe not. And I think we should have at least enough humility to suggest that, to look at what other states are doing and why they're doing that and uh, how their citizenry reacts to their judiciary. Um, and also, and this is with all, all due respect to those who represent uh, rural areas, but I am not convinced. We, we've always said that people just know their judges in these smaller communities. And I am not convinced that's necessarily true because I think the people who are asking or who stating that are the insiders. I'm not sure, you know, Bob at the filling station necessarily knows all his judges, but I'll just set that aside for right now because I know uh, in Harris County where I uh, was lucky enough to have a judicial um, career, I know they didn't know me. Um, and, you know, 
I happened to marry a guy who had kind of an Irish name and that was good. Uh, I chose to run as a Republican and in that time, that was good. Uh, I, I am a woman or at least I used a woman's name and that was good. Those were all things that assisted me to get on the ballot. And, you know, we have to take a step back and say, there's got to be something wrong with this selection process. So, um, Continuing the commission is a good idea, but these are these are some interesting questions that uh, Chairman Bank has put together that really is the distillation of the comments that have been made by um, those who've appeared before us, and even those who kind of like the system that got them elected because some of them were incumbents, were willing to look at ways to enhance the process and to enhance uh, citizens' confidence in our system. So I, I do think that we should give um, a deeper look than just stopping at question number one. Thanks. Thank you, Judge. Hey. Any other comments? Yes, David, I, I have something as well. Can yeah, you David Oliveira. Thank you, and, and David, thank you. I have to echo what the other commission member said. Thank you for your hard work. Uh, David, I agree with much of what you say. As you as you well know, I'm a trial lawyer too, and I've spent a lot of time trying cases. We, you know, we probably don't. I, I think we do a better job of, of electing qualified people in, in South Texas, but but we're, we're quickly you know going from a uh, I wouldn't say a rural area, but you know, obviously you know when you've got close to a million people in in one county, we're you know quickly going. Uh, to an urban area where uh, uh, I think most of our voters don't know the, the judges they're electing. And I think down here too, the, you know, the other thing is just the, you know, the role of, of money and campaign contributions, it's, it's just gotten out of hand. I know that you know, a lot of you know, lawyers feel that way and, and across the state, so we have to address that. I, I also agree with much of what Chip said, but I, I don't agree with a one size fits all. I, I know I studied Representative Landsgraf, uh, his proposed bill last session, and, and I liked a lot of what he had in there. I thought it was well thought out. Uh, I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we have to have an eye on, 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 on you, know, what, you know, what can we get through the legislature? And, and you know, I think that it was important to have all the legislators and I appreciated all their input because at the end of the day, it won't, it won't do us a damn bit of good to recommend a bunch of changes that they've got no chance of passing it. And so, you know, I'm all for continuing the commission and continuing to work with our legislators, but but I don't think a one size fits all approach is gonna work. And I don't think it would, it, it would you know, uh, uh, get, you know, the, the approval of the legislature. So I, I think, you know, we need to, uh, we need to continue working on this. I, I agree that you know during COVID, it's hard to get the public input we needed. So I, I would recommend that we continue the commission as well. Thank you, David. Um, I'm gonna ask for a vote on uh, Representative Hunter's suggestion that the commission be continued beyond December 31, uh, 2020. In other words, that would be part of a recommendation to the Texas legislature. And the recommendation would be that the, um, and, and these aren't the precise words, but it would be something along the lines because of the pandemic, because of the difficulties presented uh, as a result thereof, um, that we believe more time is needed to uh, formulate uh, more precise views and so on. And therefore we recommend to the legislature to commission be continued. Uh, because if, 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 if the vote on that issue is gonna be seriously divided, then that makes a big difference to at least my view. So let's 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 put up for a vote, uh, Senate, uh, Representative Todd Hunter's suggestion that uh, the part of our recommendations be that the commission be authorized to continue uh, its mandate beyond December 31, 2020. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, will that vote be in the place of a report that makes recommendations or what? Or what? Or would we still issue a report as well? Uh, great question. Uh, I guess the, the the problem I have um, is that I mean, basically, as I heard Representative Hunter and, and at least uh, three members of the House of Representatives, um, they're not prepared to vote 
and think it's premature because there's a new House of Representatives, there's new leadership. And then we've got uh, our senators uh, who've already expressed their views. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure going beyond this at this point is really doable. But, but so I, I guess the short answer, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, is I'm, I don't know. It, it's really, what, what, is, what are the wishes of the commission? D David, uh, of yeah. course, I'm 100% for that. And let me clarify. When I'm reading your questions, question one, I don't think, I mean, if some people want to abstain, they can abstain. I'll answer that. It's the mechanics underneath. Question uh, that you have under two. Question three, generally, I'll answer that. It's the mechanics under that. Then I go down to question eight. The general question, I'll answer, but the mechanics. The rest of them, I do feel abstention. But I think what I'm recommending first is everybody shared their opinions here today. I haven't heard anybody go against what everybody's doing here. We have differences of opinions. I, I'm more concerned about what's happened in 2020. That's not only impacted us, but a lot of folks. And so my proposal is the first thing that we're recommending is that this commission continues uh, as soon as it expires. Now, it'll take some legislative action, but I think we should continue. We can continue while the legislature continues. And I think this is very healthy. I mean, we've heard all over the, the circle on where everybody is. This is extremely healthy. But I do want to clarify the three general questions. I don't look at mechanics handcuffing. The specific program, I think, is premature. But I do think we should continue. And I think it's very healthy to have a commission going as the legislature is meeting. And that gives the public more access legislatively and to the commission. I guess the only problem I have with continuing without legislative approval is, is you know, we're kind of an ambassador without portfolio. Oh, no, no. I said you have to have legislative approval okay. to okay. give the teeth to this. Oh, okay. And, and, and I don't, if I may be recognized, Mr. Chair, uh, and I don't think we have the option uh, of ignoring the legislative mandate. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if we have to say it's, you know, by a vote of eight to seven, uh, or it's a vote of seven to two with, uh, with six absten abstentions, I mean, uh, I think we have to report uh, to the legislature how we feel uh, about these things, and, uh, and and I don't think we have a choice. But I think that to the extent the public is watching this, and some members of the public are watching it, uh, they will. Uh, expect us uh, to come out with a report that says something other than, hey, we, we hung around and had a bunch of meetings and uh, some of them were by Zoom because of the pandemic and, and we want to keep going because we, we're getting paid so much for this. Uh, I don't think that would be the kind of report that would be either expected by the public or uh, allowed by the legislature under the current legislation. Thank you. All right, any other comments? Uh, I, I would like to get a kind of a sense of the commission on Representative Hunter's uh, uh, suggestion that the commission continue assuming we get legislative approval to do so. Um, is there anybody who's against that proposal? Let, let me come at it that way. All right, I don't see any raise of hands against that. So- well, there's I raise my yeah. hand. I'll move you. All right, Senator, I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. Yeah, I think by um, the um, the legislation absolves the commission on January 2nd. Um, I was the Senate sponsor of uh, Todd, uh, Representative Hunter's legislation. 
So this has been a great process. I I don't think that there could be a lot more accomplished in the near future on this with, with us going into legislative session. Um, I think at least from the Senate perspective, we've kind of made ourselves pretty clear how far we think we can go for now. Um, it's been a great group and I don't, uh, I, I think that there will be a time to continue to study this, but I just think at this point, it would not be uh, fruitful. That's my kind of opinion at this point, okay. thank you. All right, anybody else? Nichols. All right, Senator Nichols. I agree with Senator Huffman. Okay, anyone else? Concur, Senator Birdwell, concur. Okay, anyone else? Same here, Hinojosa. You would be against that, Senator Hinojosa? Uh, I agree with Joan Huffman, Senator Joan Huffman and uh, the other senators. Okay. With Anyone else? All right, other than the four senators, is there anybody who would be against us, including our, our rec including in our recommendations that the legislature authorize us to continue our work beyond December 31, 2020? Anyone else? Tom, you're on mute. It seems presumptuous for me to, uh, for our report, to, uh, to say that. If uh, a powerful legislator like Representative Hunter wanted to <laughs> say the, the commission was hamstrung by uh, not being able to have live meetings or get extensive testimony or run focus groups, that would be great. But uh, we have a lot of information and we can make a report. It may just, we just may not be able to command a majority of this group uh, either for abstention reasons or otherwise. So I think I agree with what I thought I heard uh, Chip Babcock say. Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I think I think what could be done, I, I think we have to vote um, because that's what the legislature charged us with doing. And my in, intuition is the vote will be on question one to retain partisan judicial selection. And I could be wrong on that, but I think that's what the vote will be. I could, I, could, I could agree with voting and making that point and then our report saying um, that a, a substantial number, or we could even take a vote, of commissioners uh, do believe that some modification of the current system is in order, uh, which would include things like, um, I haven't seen Senator Huffman's bill, but, um, but perhaps looking at qualifications, perhaps looking at terms, um, perhaps looking at uh, public voter education, you know, um, maybe housing the Secretary of State's office, I mean, things like that, um, and would recommend that the commission uh, uh, continue, uh, if the legislature so pleased, to address some of those modifications. Uh, but I don't think we can just say, we're, we're not making any recommendations, even though you've uh, com commanded us to, and um, instead just want to continue. Uh, I would be opposed to that. And I'm not sure how to uh, put that in the form of a motion, but that's what I think. Okay, thank you. I, I think I understand. Uh, so uh, let me kind of bring uh, Representative Hunter's uh, suggestion to a head. Uh, other than the four senators and perhaps uh, former Chief Justice Phillips, is there anybody who is against us putting in our report language along the lines of, uh, the, the commission is willing to continue its work if the legislature so authorizes us to do so. Anyone else who's opposed to that? I'm not opposed to that. Uh, I okay. thought the, the suggestion was is that we tell the legislature we didn't have enough time and no, uh, no, no. like to go forward. Yeah, okay. Other than the four senators, anybody who's against that suggestion and proposal? All right, that being the case, uh, other than the four senators, uh, we will include language to that effect in our report. I happen to agree with uh, uh, former Chief Justice uh, Wallace Jefferson. I think we need to take a vote on question one. I think I know what the outcome is gonna be, but I do think we need to take a vote uh, based on the information we have available at this time. And the first question is, do we recommend the continuation of our partisan judicial selection? And I'd like to just go down the chain and let's just vote. Uh, so Megan, could you uh, 
call the various people and, and let's record their vote. Sure. Chairman Beck. I vote no. Senator Birdwell. We can come back to Senator Birdwell. He might have stepped away. Okay. Uh, no, I, I, uh, I, I thought I was off mute, but I was on mute. So my apologies, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Hinojosa. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm wanting to keep the president. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, Senator. The question is: Do we recommend the continuation of our partisan judicial selection method? Uh, yes. Okay. Aye. Thank you, Senator Huffman. Aye. Senator Nichols. Aye. Representative Hunter. I I want everybody to know I'm going to answer one, three, and eight because those are philosophy. That's not handcuffing us to a system. So do we recommend the continuation of our partisan judicial selection? No. Representative Langraf. I vote no. Representative Norris. Aye. Representative Sherman. Yes. Mr. Babcock. No. Judge Jameson. No. Chief Justice Jefferson. No. Ms. Liberato. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yes. yes. Aye. Mr. Oliveira. Sorry, Mr. Oliveira. Yes, no? No. I'm, I'm sorry, how did you vote, David? I, I said no. Okay, thank you. Then Chief Justice Phillips. No. Okay. So that's eight no's and seven yeses, if my count is correct. That's correct. Okay. Uh, now the eight of us just agree on everything and we have a report. <laughs> I want to re recount. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I guess the next question is, do we go down, if you will, down ballot, if you will, and start uh, trying to answer some of these other questions? Uh, and uh, I guess I don't know at this point whether that makes a lot of sense. What, what does the commission think? Um, Mr. Chairman, it seems to me that there's at least some low hanging fruit there. Uh, maybe not the specifics and, and that could get us um, you know, in a quagmire, but, but one is, um, should we look at modifying uh, the qualifications of a judge? And it seemed like there's a lot of agreement on, uh, at least on that aspect. And um, so I would, I would go there too. And the second that I think there's consensus in, um, and I want to be on record, I, I am uh, very supportive of the increase in diversity of our judiciary, including in Harris County. I wish it would, were more statewide. So I think diversity is extremely important. And I've sent Chairman Beck some language on that, um, uh, should we do so. But, but I think the idea of uh, if the system has changed, retaining and keeping uh, those judges who were elected um, in historic fashion in the last few elections, I think there's consensus on that. Um, and so my recommendation would be at least that we um, see if I'm correct about that consensus. Okay, I think that's an excellent point. Uh, why don't we uh, move to question seven I mean, there's nothing to prevent us from uh, skipping around. And so from we voted on one, let's vote on number seven, 
Uh, and Senator Huffman, this has to do, as you know, with recommending increasing the minimum qualifications of judges, which I think is a subject in which you are uh, very interested. So uh, let me open up the floor to discussion on question seven. Any thoughts, comments? Well, I'll start if nobody else. Oh, okay. Lynn, Lynn came in just maybe ahead of me. Okay, yeah, but she's on mute. Yeah. Okay, well, she's on mute. She lost okay. her place. Uh, <laughs> I, I think this is okay. a, a very important uh, issue. And we already, our age requirements are stouter than in most other states. Uh, many states have one year of experience or, or none, but uh, we're by far the largest state that has all these elections with everybody on the ballot <laughs> uh, every time. So I think qualifications are important. And I think just increasing the number of years is too ham-handed. I look at at the members of our current Supreme Court, at federal judges in Texas who started in the state system. And, you know, with all due respect, one or more of the people on this call, and I think just saying X number of years of having a law license without it being yanked by the disciplinary system is insufficient. And that means that it's harder uh, to, and I'm sure Senator Huffman's run into this, it's harder to know how to cast that uh, uh, in terms of experience. Uh, but I think we need to, to wrestle with it. Uh, the alternative is um, changing the ballot access rules. There are two alternatives. One is doing what in urban areas, you know, you now, and statewide, you now have to have signatures to run for office. So there could be some other indicia that you could check off that we could do by ballot access that may not require a constitutional amendment. And I think it, that's worth thinking about. And the other alternative to all this is putting something on the ballot, uh, incumbent or whether or not you are board certified, which you can could just be listed on the ballot uh, and that would not require a constitutional amendment. Uh, but I hope that we don't just say, okay, 12 years of experience to be a district judge, and that would mean Heck and Enoch and Alice Oliver and me, and you can name a whole bunch of other people wouldn't have been judges and declare victory and go home. Uh, hope it's a more subtle and nuanced approach than that. Hey, uh, Lynn Liberato. Yeah, uh, my initial question was more one of process, and that is, uh, would we be voting that the qualifications should be increased or would we, we be addressing the specifics? Uh, but in regard, but it sounds like at least to a degree, we will be discussing the specifics. Uh, so if I may, let me comment on a couple of things in that regard. First is that, um, uh, and gosh, you hate with uh, uh, wonderful, talented Chief Justice Phillips having gone on the bench so young to make a statement like I'm going to, but in most cases, his accepted and some others we know of, uh, there is just judgment to be gained uh, by uh, being a lawyer longer, being a judge longer. And I don't think four years is enough. Uh, you can always come up with exceptions uh, and some great exceptions, but the rule is that the more experienced uh, a judge is, uh, at least a minimum. Um, you know, I think that uh, the district judges should be eight years uh, or at least six, but four, uh, uh, just knowing a lot of four-year lawyers, while they're good, I don't think that even the best of them, uh, with a few exceptions, have the judgment uh, that it takes uh, to be effective. Uh, so that's kind of going with the majority. I think also, Corn Cornyn and Enoch, I mean, sorry, Cornyn, no, and, okay. Cornyn yeah. and Abbott probably might have met the six years. They wouldn't have met the eight. So that yeah. might be a practical. Well, let's go with six then <laughs> for political reasons. But I, all right, uh, six. Six is uh, six okay. I, I just, uh, uh, you know, on every single thing we address, we can find an exception to the rule. You know, we can find sweeps that brought in fabulous judges and got rid of not good judges. So, I mean, I'm just 
you know, I don't want to get back in that, but my point being that, that there certainly are exceptions. I like the idea of putting incumbency on the ballot uh, if we have, uh, you know, as we continue to have elections, because I think the more information a voter has, the better. Uh, we know they don't have very much, and that may be a negative uh, to some voters, but I, I think that that's um, a good idea to give more information and then hearkening back to what Chief Justice Jefferson has said, uh, looking for ways to help educate voters. Uh, is, uh, um, uh, and they do do it in other states. I noticed California being one of them. So uh, a, a, a big a state with a big population uh, can do that uh, in some creative ways. Those are my comments. And let me ask you a question. And, and, uh... Chief Justice Phillips too. Uh, I know that one of the proposals uh, that has been recommended to us that before you can serve on the Texas Supreme Court, you must have served as a judge before. Um, what do you think about that? I've got reservations about whether or not you need to have served as a judge before. I think we've had judges in the past. I think Chief Justice Calvert was not a judge before. I think you've had other judges on the Supreme Court uh, um, that uh, have been excellent judges that had no previous judicial experience. They were just very bright, uh, very learned, very scholarly, and very wise individuals. So do you really think it's necessary for, to, to go, to, before you can be named to the Supreme Court, you must have been a judge before. I mean, it seems to me you're limiting your options. I would, I uh, actually, I think I would defer to Chief Justice Jefferson and uh, Justice Jameson, whose dad falls into that category. Uh, I definitely think my dad would have been a better judge if he'd had prior judicial experience. <laughs> I don't know what he was doing up there. <laughs> but Judge uh, Chief Justice Greenhill had no prior judicial experience either. So our chiefs are probably about half and half in modern times. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a bit ham-handed. Any arbitrary rule is, is ham-handed. Uh, Wallace might have a, a perception of a middle ground here. Well, I, I'm going to, I would like, so, so I agree, uh, Chief Justice Phillips and Judge Jameson, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that restriction. Uh, but I would do this, um, uh, something like this, I would say, uh, uh, in terms of minim, minimal qualifications, to gain access to the ballot as a judicial candidate, the candidate must provide, let's say, to the Secretary of State or somebody, um, uh, proof that they have, um, if they're running for a district bench, that they have at least three jury trials as lead counsel uh, that were tried to verdict, or for an appellate bench, at least three appeals uh, to, that included oral argument as lead counsel that led to an opinion from the Court of Appeals. Uh, that's, that's probably less than I would prefer if, if I were, um, but, but I think it, it at least demonstrate, and it's not board certification. Um, anyone who's board certified would qualify in those categories. But it would at least uh, ensure that somebody who's on the bench has had some experience knowing the rules of procedure, um, both civil and appellate, and has been lead counsel. And included in those requirements, I would uh, have that candidate um, lay out or to state what the amount um, in controversy was or what the legal issues were. Um, and those would all be available for the voters' consideration as well in some public forum. Um, so at least you have to have some kind of experience before you're uh, presiding over these very um, important cases that judges handle all the time. Uh, Judge Jefferson, uh, yes, can I ask you a question about that? Sure. Um, and, and I like the, the, the con with your permission, David. Um, and I, I sure like the concept of it, but um, you know, some of our best judges and a, a perspective that's really good, uh, speaking as an appellate lawyer, uh, on the appellate bench is that of trial court judges. And so there certainly would be many, maybe the vast majority of trial judges who wouldn't have that appellate experience um, uh, uh, you know, going into the, the um, appellate courts. How, one, way, one way to answer I know that. you know my point. What, I, and I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm just questioning you know, your thoughts. I'm just asking your thoughts on that. 
So one way to answer that, um, and because I'm looking more for merit than, than um, that particular experience. So you could say if you have um, appellate experience, then you can serve. So make the two qualifications that I just mentioned, trials and appeals. Um, if you have those, you can be a candidate for either a trial or appellate bench. So uh, a lawyer that has argued three appeals um, to uh, an opinion can is qualified to run as a district judge. A, a, a lawyer who has tried three um, matters to verdict can run for uh, an appellate bench. Um, I mean, that's one way to answer that. Our, our constitutional requirements now say uh, experience as a lawyer or as a judge of a court of record, I think. Uh, so the right. county court at law judges can run for district court. Uh, if that's been part of their four years of experience. And one of those judges or a district judge can run for a appellate court with a 10 year requirement if part of their 10 years has been as a judge. So we could, you know, we could look at it that way. Uh, some of our new judges have come from municipal court. And if it's a, one of these that meets on Thursday night once a month, I'm not sure that's very good experience, but if, if it's full time, real salary, like in, like in the urban areas, that might satisfy too. But the, the question is, can we do this by statute or is it best to do it by constitutional amendment? And if it's constitutional amendment, it has to be more carefully thought out for sure, because it can't be changed. Uh, Mr. Chairman, just to answer, or to at least uh, uh, think about that question, was it by statute uh, that you couldn't, be on the ballot uh, for an appellate race uh, for the Supreme Court without obtaining signatures from each of the appellate districts. It wasn't a constitutional amendment. Uh, so it seems to me that uh, we'd want to study that, but it seems to me that you could um, require that sort of experience um, with a statutory change that would enhance tremendously uh, the, the qualifications and merit of, of the pools of, of people who are seeking a judicial bench. Thank you. Uh, any other comments on uh, question seven, please? Um, Mr. Yes, Chairman, Judge Jameson. Uh, along the lines of what Chief Justice uh, Jefferson was suggesting, I think if there were kind of a catch-all phrase, if he's suggesting that you would present these credentials to the Secretary of State or someone, and if there were a, or otherwise, so that someone could have an alternative path that still would demonstrate um, requisite experience. Mm -hmm. um, I also, on question seven under B, there's age, and I wouldn't mess with the age. I think if uh, if we increase uh, the the years you're a lawyer, that you're probably not going to still be 25 anyway. And right now right. we have a mandatory retirement at 75. And I, I wouldn't really mess with that yet either. Okay. All right. Any other comments on seven? Uh, I think we need to vote on it. And what I'm proposing is that we vote on question seven, the way it's currently framed, and then submit as part of our report, just some of the suggestions that have been made by former Chief Justice Wallace Jefferson, Justice Phillips, and others as part of the report, but we're basically voting on question seven. Do we recommend increasing the minimum qualifications of judges? Uh, Senator Nichols. Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm sorry, Senator Bergwell. I'm sorry. Um, I, uh, uh, I think I like what you've just described, Chairman Beck. I just wanna make sure that it's absolutely clear that if there's, there's a lot of merit to what Justice Jefferson said but I'm, I'm more prepared to vote on seven broadly, but leave the granularity to being what you just described, but making sure the report says that it does not bind me. I, I, I think we need to look at qualifications, but any of these suggestions do not come across as a binding commitment on the members of the legislature. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a valid point. The, the way, what, what I was suggesting is that we, all these comments about increasing years of experience and putting incumbents in are simply suggestions that have been made by members of the commission. Full stop. Okay. I, yeah. Mr. Yes, Mr. Chairman? Yes. 
I can't see who's raised their hand. Well, uh, Landgraf, uh, oh, I think, uh, Rep. unless Landgraf. somebody else. Sorry, I couldn't see your hand. Uh, no problem. Uh, maybe to, uh, I share the concerns that Senator Birdwell has. Maybe if we're going to put this to a vote, uh, maybe the, the specific item should be that the commission recommends that the legislature uh, consider the, the merits of increasing the minimal qualifications of judges. Um, and then that way we don't have to uh, uh, make any binding statements on any of these particular areas since it, it doesn't seem like uh, there may be consensus. But then, you know, that way we can make a recommendation to the legislature that this be evaluated, uh, but, but leaving, uh, you know, leaving the, the details uh, to the legislative body. I guess the only thought I would have, Representative Landgap, is that's really part of our mandate, isn't it? That, that we need to make a recommendation about whether or not we think increasing the minimum qualifications makes sense or not. I mean, the legislature can do whatever it's going to do. Sure, uh, sure. But we've got to make a recommendation up or down, it seems to me, on that subject. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I, I don't know if she's ready to talk about details or process, but I'd be interested in what Senator Huffman. Emer you know, emerging legislation is looking like. Is it a constitutional amendment or just a statute? And what are some of the, if she's well, if she's ready to talk about it, what are some of the considerations there? Um, it's, a, it's a work in process. Did, did you want me to answer, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. You know, that's up to you, Senator. I mean, he, he's basically asking what, what you're planning. And so... <laughs> 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 That's really up to you plan, if you feel like you're in a position to uh, respond or not. Well, you know, it's interesting. We can all talk about it. The plan has to, is, 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 is going to be what I can get the votes for. So uh, it is, it is a constitutional amendment. It will, the hope is it will increase the qualifications of those who run for office. Uh, but I'm still working, um, trying to look for some joint authors with my senators here. I haven't had a chance to discuss all the details with them. Um, but that the goal was a constitutional amendment. And at this point, it's more looking of at, at years, which some people have expressed objections to. Um, but, but we're looking at it and, and I'm, you know, I'm willing certainly to speak with anyone who has good ideas about it. So it's a work in progress. Okay. I just didn't want us to step on your, <laughs> on what you well, do. Yeah. Well, I'm, I was, I'm still working on it, but, um, but yeah. Okay. So, all right. Uh, any other comments before we vote on question seven? And and just to be clear, uh, question seven is: uh, Do we recommend increasing the minimum qualifications of judges? That will be. We'll vote on that up or down. And some of these other items have been mentioned, such as putting incumbency on the ballot, increasing year. We're just going to put this in the report as suggestions made by members of the commission, and then the legislature can do whatever it wills. In other words, it's not binding. That part's not binding. Okay, uh, all those in favor of question seven, as I have explained it, um, let why don't we see if we can take a voice vote on this? I don't know that anybody's going to be against it, but yeah, well, I, I'll be. All right, hold, hold on. Let, let's Megan. Let's go voice vote. I mean, let's go commissioner by commissioner. <laughs> That's the easiest way to do it. Okay. All right, Chairman Beck. I vote yes. Senator Birdwell. Aye. Senator Hinojosa. Aye. Senator Huffman. Aye. Senator Nichols. Aye. Representative Hunter. Abstain. Representative Landgraf. I abstain as well. Representative Menares. Aye. Representative Sherman. Nay. I'm sorry, what was the vote? Nay. No. No. Okay. Mr. Babcock. Yes. Judge Jameson. Yes. Chief Justice Jefferson. Yes. Ms. Liberato. Yes. Mr. Oliveira. Yes. And Chief Justice Phillips. Yes. Okay, uh, let's move to question eight, which has to do with money. 
Uh, question eight, uh, so do we recommend the adoption of rules to limit the role of money in elections? So let me throw that up, out to, up to discussion. It seems to me the Judicial Campaign Fairness Act has worked pretty well in most of the state. I'd, I'd be interested in Mr. Oliveira's view of, I mean, in the valleys, the main place where people started filing documents that they chose not to comply with, with it, which you can do. Uh, there's certainly some areas we could look at. If we, if we went to retention elections, I would want to severely limit office holder accounts. Uh, and I wish that they would reimpose the uh, prohibition on judicial candidates giving money to the political party for reasons other than literature that they were included in, things like that. But just if this means the contributions are too large, I mean, the, the caps are too large and it should be a lot smaller, we already have a virtually insurmountable problem. Or if it was a trade-off that judges could raise less money, but there would be an official state pamphlet uh, that was mailed to every voter, and there'd be wide, there'd be advertisement about how to access uh, campaign websites and such through the Secretary of State. I'd, I'd be for that, but just in the whole to say, okay, everybody should only raise a hundred dollars, and good luck. Uh, it seems to me we're only exacerbating the problems with of voter up, it being too hard for voters to find out how to cast an intelligent vote in a judicial race. Well, is the public financing of judicial campaigns, I mean, is that, does that make any sense at all from a, a fiscal perspective? I proposed once to take the lawyer occupation tax and put it into that fund. And, but of the 181 legislators, I couldn't find a, anybody that was for it. So unless, unless things have changed. Yeah, it, it seems to me that that's not really a viable option, having the public uh, you know, finance our judicial elections. I mean, the states that have experimented with it have abandoned it. Well, both North Carolina and West and Wisconsin had it, and it, it was at one time pretty viable in Wisconsin as a yeah. state income tax checkoff. But fewer and fewer people checked it each year that they wanted part of their money to go that way, and so they abolished it. And North Carolina got rid of it pretty quickly. What, what about office holder accounts? How, how does that really work? Well, I mean, if you used to be able to use it to run for a political office, and now that's no longer possible. Uh, but well, Tom, Tom let, me have, let me interrupt. If, if a judge raises $100,000 to run for re-election or, or for initial election, and he only spends 50, can he retain the other 50 and use it for whatever purpose? No, there's six, there's six purposes you can use it for. Okay. And, in defense of the system, uh, judges need some money uh, to get their CLE, to go travel to swear another judge into office. There, there are reasons you need some money that it's not considered to be an official expense. Uh, but there are some judges that have hundreds of thousands of dollars in these accounts and it, they keep raising money when they don't have an opponent and know they're not gonna have an opponent and then spend the money in ways that fall within these six categories, mm -hmm. but are still questionable, like, you know, multiple birthday parties a year at Tony's Wine Cellar or something. And uh, those who've been district judges more recently than me can speak to it with more authority. Okay. Martha. Well, out-of-state CLE used to be about the most expensive thing, um, and you know, NIDA, and there were some, there were some good out-of-state, uh, but from what I hear from those who are trial judges more recently than I, uh, there, there are some, well, you're aware, there's some, there's some extra large accounts, and, um, it's it's a, it's a it's an unnecessary temptation for people to curry favor. Any other comments, Mr. Uh, Chair? Um, uh, I, I've said this before, but um, uh, it's important, I think, to keep repeating it, uh, which is uh, any regulation in this area 
uh, has got to be very carefully done because of the First Amendment uh, and the uh, United States Supreme Court's decision uh, on campaign finance law. Uh, and not only the Supreme Court, but other lower courts and state courts. But uh, I think that there could be some uh, areas where the legislature could do some good on this. Um, uh, Chief Justice Phillips talked about office holder accounts and uh, there's a there's a judge uh, in a large county in Texas right now who doesn't have an opponent uh, or didn't have an opponent uh, running unopposed in the primary and the general and and I must have gotten you know I don't know ten or fifteen flyers a month uh, seeking uh, money and uh, that maybe we could do something about that but okay Mr. yes one. Um, possible way to deal with this, because I agree with Chief Justice Phillips that the Campaign Reform Act for judges was very successful in many ways and has um, tamped down uh, the expenditures in Texas as opposed to some of our uh, sister states like in Alabama or Illinois where the amount spent uh, can dwarf the state as big as Texas is because most people voluntarily comply. Uh, but one thing that we might consider is um, to uh, require more robust transparency and reporting of what is in an office holder's account. Right now, you have to go to, you know, you, you have to be a little bit sophisticated to understand uh, how much is retained by a judge after an election. Uh, but again, I think we could um, use the good offices of Secretary of State, perhaps, uh, to require, you know, some uh, more, um, disclosure of, of what these amounts are, and then let those judges defend, you know, why they have a million dollars when they haven't been opposed in the last 10 years in an office holder account, um, and maybe go about it that way. That's just a recommendation or a suggestion. What yeah, happens, and I would, that, what happens I would, to that money if, if the judge decides he's, he or she's not running for election anymore? Yeah, four, five, four, four years. Four years. Of it. In sorry. one of the six ways. Uh, which includes giving it to a charity, uh, giving it to other political campaigns. I don't remember what else, but they're pretty broad. In other words, you can sort of be a power center when you're back in private practice with your leftover office holder money. And Mr. Chair, I, I would second uh, Chief Justice Jefferson's thought about that. I think transparency is one area that uh, can survive scrutiny under the First Amendment. And I think that would be a huge uh, improvement in what we have now. Okay. But Jim, there, there's no First Amendment problem with forbidding or limiting office holder accounts, is there? I mean, because most states don't have them. Texas is kind of an unusual outlier there. No, I don't, I don't think, generally speaking, there is a First Amendment problem in that area. Is there a problem with saying you can't raise money if you don't have an opponent? I don't think so. Well, but but as somebody mentioned, um, you know, the judges aren't are the, the judges um, salaries are not commensurate with what they could make in private practice. Many judges are not wealthy um, at all. Um, they're doing it really as public service. And so, um, so, so imagine you're a public servant in a judicial office. And then as Tom says, you have CLE you have to do. Okay, well, maybe that could be accepted. Uh, but then you have um, uh, uh, your political party, if we stay with partisan elections, that wants you to come to the annual you know, uh, event in Houston and you got to pay your way there. And then uh, some organization that could be important to an election in four years ask you to speak uh, for no pay and no travel expenses at their, you know, civic, you know, group. The the, uh, you, you know, I mean, you can think of what the, those are: bar associations, etc. So, the office holder accounts, to me, play that important role in keeping these political animals um, around, you know, getting access and, and uh, exposure around the state. So we've got to be um, a little bit careful about how much you restrict. I, I agree there shouldn't be officeholder accounts 
you know, people, <laughs> I've, I've known some judges, they invest in the stock market, you know, and they, they're just very proud of how much they can make in their office holder account. Well, we, I could see some limits on that, but we, we, well, I don't think we can, we should go too far. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, let's go ahead and, and vote if there are no further comments on question number eight. And the precise question is, do we recommend the adoption of rules uh, to further limit the rule of money in elections? You and mean judicial would... elections? I'm sorry? <laughs> judicial elections, because then you go into other statutes. Okay. Gone to meddling there. Mr. Chairman. Um, Hold on just a second. Hold on just a second. In judicial act. Yes. Can I suggest that instead of further limit um, the, that it be further regulate? That's fine. I'll accept that. And that way the legislature can do what it wishes, either limit or do something different. Okay, so uh, question eight, as currently uh, stated is, do we recommend the, the adoption of rules to regulate the role of money in judicial elections? Further again, regulate. I'm sorry? Further regulate. All right. Do we recommend the, do we recommend the adoption of rules to further regulate the role of money in judicial elections? And as with question seven, some of these suggestions that have come forth uh, such as transparency and uh, potentially eliminating or, or uh, limiting to some extent all programs. There'll be suggestions that have been made by members of the commission. So the, what we're ba basically voting on is question eight and some of the other items that have been the subject of discussion will really just be in our report as suggestions made by specific members of the commission. So with that understanding, uh, Megan, will you call the roll please? Chairman Beck. Yes. Senator Birdwell. Nay. Senator Hinojosa. Aye. Senator Huffman. Come back to you. Um, Senator Nichols. Nay. Representative Hunter. Yes. Representative Langraff. Aye. Representative Menares? Aye. Representative Sherman? Yes. Aye. Mr. Babcock? Yes. Judge Jamison? Yes. Chief Justice Jefferson? Yes. Ms. Liberato? Yes. Mr. Oliveira? Yes. Chief Justice Phillips? Yes. And then Senator Huffman, I didn't get yours. I'm a no. No. Thank I, you. Am I still You got me? Okay. Okay. All right. uh, thank you, everyone. I, I would propose going back to question uh, number three, which has to do with. Uh, do we recommend a nonpartisan judicial selection system with any of the following requirements? Uh, and uh, first of all, let me open it up to discussion. It's, it seems to me that based upon the vote on question one, that pretty well is gonna be determinative of the vote on question three, but perhaps I'm wrong. So let me open that up to discussion. Do we recommend um, a nonpartisan judicial election system with any of the following requirements? Uh, Chairman Beck, may I speak to that? Yes, Judge James. I was thinking about this just this morning, and um, although it answers some of the questions, um, some of the concerns that have been raised with partisan elections, um, my main concern is who would run that election. It's a statewide, it's a state office or a district or a county office, but. Um, the parties who are responsible for running certain um, elections would not be responsible for running a nonpartisan election. So that's my main concern. 
And maybe there's an easy answer. Any other comments or suggestions? Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Yes, Chairman, uh, Chip, Chip Babcock. Uh, question three has got some elements in it that I like. Uh, I like a nonpartisan retention uh, election after appointment, but I don't see those elements combined into one option. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think that uh, Chip, but I think that other some one or more of the other questions is going to deal with that precise point you talked yeah. about. I think you're right. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on question three? All right, Megan, you want to call the roll? Yes. Chairman Beck. Uh, I vote no. Senator Birdwell. Nay. Senator Hinojosa. Nay. Senator Huffman. No. Senator Nichols. Nay. Representative Hunter. Abstain. Representative Langraf. Yes. I'm sorry, he voted yes? Yes. Representative Menares. Yes. Representative Sherman. Yes. Mr. Babcock. No. Judge Jameson. I'm not sure M-E-H is one of our choices as a, as a vote. Um, this is a hard one for me. Um, I'll vote no. Mr. Wall, uh, Chief Justice Jefferson. No. Ms. Liberato. No. Mr. Oliveira. No. And Chief Justice Phillips. Yes. Um, and I don't understand. I, I would love for people to give a 30 second explanation of their votes. Maybe I'm missing something. All right. That, does that conclude the vote, uh, Megan? Yes. And what is the tally? So I have four yeses. And that the four yeses are Representative Landsgraf, Representative Sherman, and, Rep and Chief Justice Phillips, and who else? Um, Representative Menares. Oh, okay. And then I have right. uh, um, Representative Hunter. Abstaining. Yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yes. This is David Oliveira. If I could, I I'd like to change my vote to a yes. I actually was, after reading it again, it would be inconsistent with my previous vote, so. Uh, okay. I vote yes. All right. Thank you. All right. Um, let's move to question four, please. Do we recommend that all judges initially be appointed? And let me just say, I don't know, just based on our previous discussion, I don't know that there's anybody on this commission that's in favor of lifetime appointments like the federal system. Uh, if I'm wrong, somebody can correct me. So it seems to me we're, we're basically talking about um, you know, other alternatives. Uh, but the, the key point is that the judge would initially be appointed subject to retention elections or some other form of uh, review or vote. So let me just begin with the, uh, the overarching question is, do we recommend that all judges initially be appointed? Any discussion? And uh, Mr. Chairman, this it's, it, it's only the A, Bs, and Cs there. In other words, this is an appointment without a retention election. That's if, the answer is yes. So this is the only option. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. This is the only option of, on our page that seems to really remove the right to vote at any time for a a Texas judge. I think that's a fair statement because here we're not talking about uh, uh, an appointment and then retention or some other form of review that would give the public direct input. We're just talking basically about should all judges initially be appointed. I just don't see anyone going to answer this yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can do a voice yeah. vote. Oh, okay. Well, let, let's let's bring this to a head quickly then. Is there anyone, Mr. Chair? Hang on for a minute. Okay, go ahead. Uh, 
Question 4C says, uh, appointment for a term of years, e.g. merit selection. I misread it then. So uh, I'm for that, but uh, but if you take that EG out of there, then I'm not I'm not for it. Um, I I think the EG oh. in there was really just to kind of give uh, an example, and as I recall, in, in Judge Phillips, you probably know better than I, but in New Jersey. I think the initial appointment was was a merit selection system, but was there any subsequent election of any type of that particular nominee or candidate? No, and, I mean New Jersey and several other states, the governor has to reappoint you, and it's pretty political. It's yeah. not a system we would want. But I, I believe uh, Chip is exactly right. The four C looks like it includes. Merit selection, as that's generally known in most states, with a retention election, and then it's refined in the later questions. So I think we all need to be on the same page about the scope of this when we vote, and it may need to be reworded before we vote. Well, I, I tell you, why don't we, for the sake of our uh, vote, let's strike EG New Jersey Merit Selection System, okay, in subdivision C. So basically all we're voting on, do we recommend that all of our judges in Texas going forward initially be appointed? That's the question. And initially, I mean, initially and keep their job without uh, a submission to the voters at large. That's essentially correct. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so they're appointed for whatever the term of office is. Right. A lifetime or a certain number of years. That's it. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative. I, I, I'm sorry. Do we need to clarify then on this question, uh, since we have had some discussion earlier about? Uh, it, uh, I hate using the term uh, "grandfather" in, but but those uh, members of the judiciary who have already been duly elected, uh, do we want to have any sort of uh, clarification that they would not be immediately subject to appointment if if they still are serving? a term after having been duly elected, if that makes sense. Or is that is that beyond the scope of, of this particular issue? Well, I, I think it is beyond the scope of our issue because I think, you know, you know as I said at the outset, that everybody agrees, <clears throat> I think, that, uh, that anybody who has just been elected <clears throat> or is serving after being elected is grandfathered in regardless of what we recommend and regardless of whatever is adopted by the legislature. Okay, then then I think we have the clarity that we need. Thank okay. you. All right, so, and I think I know how this vote's gonna come out. Is there anybody who's in favor uh, of question four that all of our judges initially be appointed? Is anybody on the commissions in favor of that? All right, I take it by your silence that uh, that vote is unanimous. Mm -hmm. Although, uh, Representative Hunter, have you abstained on that? Yes. Okay. So, so the vote is unanimous, but for Representative uh, Hunter, who has abstained. Has anybody else abstained? The question is unanimous which way? I'm sorry? Unanimous which way? Unanimous no or unanimous yes? It, it's, it's unanimous that we do not recommend that all judges be appointed. Okay, thank you. And then it's unanimous, but for uh, Representative Hunter who has abstained. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, on question nine, I, I the answer is no, but I'm curious what the commission thinks. Regardless of recommendations, do we recommend term limits for all judges? Yes, that, that was an issue that has come up uh, frequently in our discussions. Uh, and I think we need to get clarity on that issue. So let's all turn to question nine, which is, do we recommend term limits for all judges? Short of the current 75 year 
mandatory retirement. Right. I mean, it's, it, I mean that's law now. It's 75, you're, you're retired. But here we're talking about, you know, you can only serve two, two elected terms. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, Senator, Senator Birdwell. Birdwell. Uh, let me, me bring some, uh, just a little bit of experience with this, because I, I, I was the gentleman that carried the Convention of States in 2017 that dealt with uh, a Convention of the States to discuss term limits at the federal level, not just those related to uh, the legislative branch, but also to the executive uh, subordinates to the uh, to the president, like the FBI director and others, as well as the judicial uh, branch. I I think the question here for us at the state level, not necessarily muddled, but there is a difference between term limits between the federal level and the state level, because. The people in, that elect representatives from Florida and their senators from Florida or, or pick any other state, their votes at the federal level impact the state of Texas the same way their home state is impacted with that vote. But votes at the, for state office holders and the links of those, as an example, our dean in the Senate, John Whitmire, has been in the Senate for nearly 40 years. But the only impact that his vote has on out-of-state folks is a vote for a constitutional amendment that is sent to the legislatures for ratification. Um, I don't think that we discuss this in great. I'm, I'm inclined to say no, because generally the election is the term limit. But there may be merit somewhere out there that we may not have covered. Uh, I, I remember in one of the recommendations, I think it, or not the recommendations, but your summation of the committee's work in the document, the 35 page document that Megan sent, that there was discussion of if, if we went to an appointed system or, or some other system that, that I don't support, so I don't know if it's tethered to that per se, that do district judges serve for a shorter period of time than the appellate judges and the appellate judges serve for a shorter period of time than the, the statewide courts? There may be merit to having that discussion, but if it's tethered to appointment, it's not a discussion I want to have. If we're sticking with the, the, the statement and we're pretty split on it in the sense of partisan elections, but if we're sticking with elections, I think the term limit is the, the, the people's vote, because I'm similar to the, the difficulty that I, that I found with term limits is that most people like term limits for the other guy's candidate, not their own. <laughs> and so uh, while, while incumbents tend to get elected at a, at a higher than 90% reelection rate, except for what we've seen in, in the partisan swings that Judge Hecht and and the very, the, the very reason I think this commission was brought about, I'd be very hesitant. I see this similarly to telling people they can't vote for their candidate of choice, though it's a subset of whether you're voting for your candidate or not, it's a subset of that, but it's fundamentally telling you or telling the citizens who they can and cannot have after a certain time period has expired. So I would generally say I'm no, but I don't know that we've explored this to the level of granularity that a vote is even appropriate at this point. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, the Chief Justice Phillips. Uh, following up on Senator Birdwell's observations, in most countries in the world with a constitutional high court, uh, you are limited to a single long term. And uh, Justice Enoch, said something very wise one time. He said, you can't take partisanship out of how you get to be a judge, whether it's appointed or elected or uh, any, any rational system other than lottery is going to have politics, but you can take politics out of staying a judge. And one way he proposed once was a long single term. And there's something to be said for that for the two high courts. New York, for instance, has a 14 year term. You have a term that's long enough that you're going to get a pension at the end of that term, and you're not going to seek re-election because you're barred. And, and I would be willing to explore that. But for the other 
3,000 judges in Texas. Uh, I, I think our current system of uh, the method by which you choose to stay in office uh, is sufficient to uh, is a sufficient popular check. But on the two high courts, I, I would I wouldn't be opposed to the legislature looking at that. It would be novel and it would be a uh, you know a contribution to people having greater public confidence in the high courts because nobody would be raising money or or out campaigning. Okay, any other comments on question nine? All right, there being no comments, no further comments. Uh, Megan, you wanna call the roll, please. Yes. Chairman Beck. I vote no. Senator Birdwell. Nay. Senator Hinojosa. No. Senator Huffman. No. Senator Nichols. No. Representative Hunter. Abstain. Representative Landgraf. No. Representative Menares. No. Representative Sherman. No. Mr. Babcock. No. Judge Jameson. No. Chief Justice Jefferson. No. Ms. Liberato. No. Mr. Oliveira. No. Chief Justice Phillips. Well, I'm kind of hurt that my speech had so little persuasive effect. I, <laughs> I think I'll join Representative Hunter and abstain. <laughs> it abstains, uh, the rest are no's. Okay, uh, that, we, we're now gonna turn to the last question. And this is question six. And I will ad admit to you that the predicate to question six is inaccurate. It says, if yes to four, it should say, if no to four. And we did vote no as to four. And question six is, do we recommend an appointed judicial selection system with retention, including any of the following requirements? It doesn't say all of the following requirements. It says with any of the following requirements. Uh, and we've had proposals that were submitted to us uh, this year that talked about an appointed judicial selection system by the governor. Um, we've talked about the creation uh, of a judicial selection commission, if you will, um, that vets uh, whoever the governor's appointments are. Uh, one approach is that the governor will submit uh, a nominee to that commission. The commission will say qualified, well-qualified, not qualified. Uh, there's another role that uh, has been advanced for the commission, which is to actually come up with nominees. And then they would submit a list of nominees to the governor and the governor would then select from the list. So there's a lot of nuances uh, with respect to the basic uh, proposition that, uh, uh, that we recommend an appointed judicial selection system with retention. Uh, and then you've got various requirements uh, set forth under A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, and Representative Landsgraf, you'll see that subdivision, subsection F specifically talks about grandfathering. So I think that that's, uh, I, I think every much, everyone on the commission is pretty much in agreement with F, uh, regardless of what uh, happens in the future. So anyway, uh, with that understanding, let's begin a discussion of question six. Chairman Beck? Yes, Judge Jameson. I think many states that have the Missouri plan or something close to the Missouri plan, which is what this sort of outlines, are relatively satisfied with what they have. I was um, thinking this morning, though, about um, uh, the, the Representative Tunner's, I think, desire to have the House of Representatives be more involved if there were some kind of a uh, commission uh, either by um, ha going for confirmation or otherwise. And um, I was thinking that one thing that might be helpful that the House might be uh, uniquely qualified to do would be to have about um, 26 members of the House serve on a commission in order to have one 
uh, Republican and one Democrat from each of the courts of appeal districts, and that if they were to serve, and especially for a judge that was from their area, that they would have a significant role in that. Maybe they wouldn't serve for every appointment, but definitely for when people in their areas came up, that that might be a really um, useful um, uh, uh, involvement for the, the House of Representatives. I won't belabor any of this because we've talked about this many, many times, but yes, I would be in favor of uh, some, for a system like this. Okay. You know, what, one uh, interesting um, uh, thought that uh, I know was submitted to the commission earlier was um, the creation of citizen panels, if you will, at the local level. Um, the, the notion being that people at the local level probably have a better understanding of who potential nominees might be. Uh, and then they could feed from the local area to some, either to the governor directly under this type system or to some commission and so on. So, which I thought was a very intriguing concept because some of the evidence we had uh, submitted to the commission was that um, a lot of the people locally think that they don't like being dictated to from Austin. They want to have input. So there's a trickle up as opposed to a complete trickle down system. So in any event, I just want to make that point. Any other uh, comments or discussions on this? <clears throat> okay, uh, I think I pretty well know how this vote's going to come out given our uh, vote <laughs> earlier on uh, question number one. <laughs> but, but let's, Megan, let's call the roll. Chairman Beck. Uh, yes. Senator Birdwell. Nay. Senator Hinojosa. Nay. Senator Huffman. Nay. Senator Nichols. Nay. Representative Hunter. Stay. Representative Langraf. Aye. Representative Menares. No. Representative Sherman. Nay. Mr. Badcock. Yes. Ms. Jamison, or yes. Judge Jamison. Yes. Chief Justice Jefferson. Yes. Ms. Liberato. No. Mr. Oliveira. Yes. Chief Justice Phillips. Yes. Just counting them up. According to my count, it's seven seven with uh, Representative Hunter abstaining. That's right. Powerful. I knew it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, can if the seven uh, who voted yes on that all agree on one plan, uh, which may be unlikely, but it's not impossible. It would certainly strengthen our report if we said that because the devil's always been in the details on how you go to an appointed retention election system. And if we all happen to be in agreement, I don't know if we need the, to bore everybody since it will be a minority report uh, but if it could be done quickly, I'm sure Representative Hunter would be tremendously influenced by that discussion, even if he's not ready to move now. Well, I think Representative Hunter could dictate the discussions. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what are, what are the thoughts of the other members of the commission? Um, I, because there are, there are a lot of sub-questions, if you will, because if we agree, if, if the seven agree on an appointive system, um, what is gonna be the role of this so-called Texas commission? Uh, is it just gonna simply vet the governor's nominees? Is it gonna have a different role? Um, and I guess the question is whether uh, we ought to debate that now or whether we ought, that's really a drafting issue. Um, what are the other, you know, Chief Justice Jefferson? I appreciate uh, Chief Justice Phillips' um, request, but I just think we would will wind up being 
very splintered on this, and I'm I'm not sure what the this this the answer to to how exactly we do it seems to me a legislative problem. Um, you know, very political. Uh, you know, does the governor go first? Does the commission go first? I would be in favor of a commission. I want it to be very diverse. What does diversity mean? You know, how are the commissioners appointed and, and are they confirmed? But the one thing that I would say um, about all this, and I feel pretty strongly about, and I think it's, it'd be unique in, in the country, is that the House uh, play a significant role. Uh, so that it is not just, I, I, want, I would want Senate confirmation, um, but I think the House ought to play an extremely important role as well. And I don't know the character of that role and how, to, how you would um, make that happen. But I've heard from um, our representatives here and also from some around the state uh, that worry that they're not part of this process. And, and they certainly are part of the, um, you know, the, 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 our society and, and government. So, um, so anyway, I would, I'd be in favor of that, but I don't know how to achieve it. And other than that, I don't, I don't know if we can reach, I don't, I don't know if we could reach consensus on the uh, subparts. Let me, let me try a limited motion, Mr. Chairman. All right. And this is going to go back into ancient history. And the ancient history is this. Uh, the Gonzalez-Haas primary in 1994 had $6 million of reported expenditures. And it so offended Governor Bullock that he formed a committee uh, which passed some type of merit selection through the Senate, but couldn't get it through the House. So there was a study commission chaired by Tom Luce. And they came back with, a, with what I thought was a unique system of a point elect retain, but under the appointment, they took care of had a gubernatorial appointment, but took care of diversity by uh, saying that no judge could actually take office till they had been confirmed. And that confirmation <clears throat> was the Senate only, but it required a two thirds vote. And the Senate was required to meet within 30 days after the governor had made a judicial nomination, but the Senate didn't have to come itself, they could send a, 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 any senator could send a state representative that was within his district to come for this one day session. So with that as kind of a general background, my motion would be twofold, that uh, there be an appointment, we not say how it splits up between the governor and any commission, uh, or that even both of those be involved, but that somehow someone get appointed. And then at that stage, no judge takes office uh, without uh, a confirmation process that involves both the Senate and the House. Uh, and at least one of those bodies has to cast, uh, has to approve the judge by an extra, the nominee by an extraordinary majority. The theory being that most of your uh, issues about diversity being political, racial, philosophical, whatever else would be uh, would uh, be satisfied in that trading process. And that if the legislature failed to meet or failed to confirm a nominee within six months, uh, the Supreme Court would make a nominee who could only serve until the end of the term and would not be eligible uh, to stand for retention election, unlike an appointee that went through the uh, executive legislative process. There's a simple motion that got kind of complicated. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I think you've just made it more complicated. Uh, well, maybe we don't need all of that, but uh, are there any parts? I know we aren't going to get seven out of seven votes on how the initial appointment is made, but I'm wondering if we could get some consensus on the fact that the legislature, some process in the legislature has to approve the judge before the judge takes office. So I'll limit my motion to that. Okay, so your motion would be, uh, question six would be reworded to say, do we recommend an appointed selection system with no judge taking office without approval of an appropriate body in the side in the Senate and the House of Representatives, comma with retention, including well, any let's just say no judge takes off it because retention's already in there. Just say uh, 
on question six, and this is not even trying to get eight votes, I'm trying to get seven. Uh, on question six, does, regardless of how a nominee uh, is proposed, do we recommend that no nominee be confirmed and take office without legislative action? Of, uh, and just leave it at that. So you're not being specific as to the Senate or the House of Representatives. You're just saying without legislative action? Well, I got too criticized when I went into that. Uh, if Representative Landgraf had some ideas on that, I would defer to him since he's one of our seven and he's the only one that would be involved. <laughs> well, Mr. Chief Justice, I, I, I appreciate that. I, you're not going to like my response, but I think um, uh, even though I have a certain amount of pride as a member of the House of Representatives, uh, your proposed revision is, is getting a little too specific uh, for my comfort level as far as making a, a recommendation. Now, you will be celebrated throughout the, the halls of the House of Representatives uh, for, uh, for making an effort to include them specifically, but uh, I'm trying to keep uh, the commission's recommendations as, as general as possible. Um, you, you know, in an effort to uh, make sure that our report is, is well received in the legislature. So, uh, well, then my motion may die for lack of a second, which if it does, that may be better than ignominious defeat. Well, I, I thought I thought the purpose of your motion was to nudge uh, Representative Hunter into voting uh, on the basic proposal. That would have been nice, too. But, you know, he's pretty stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> I've okay, known the uh, Chief Justice think, a long time. <laughs> I think the motion dies for lack of a second. So let's go back to the basic question. Do we recommend an appointed judicial selection system with retention, including any of the following requirements? Uh, so uh, again, I think I know how this vote uh, is going to come out. I think it already has. We, we already voted on it. We already voted on it. I'm We've sorry. Voted. Okay. So what we haven't voted on is your proposed amendment, uh, Tom, and it died for lack of a second. It died for lack of a second, but I'm all for, you know, following Mr. Trump's example, and let's just keep voting on number six till it passes. <laughs> okay, uh, I think we've dealt with uh, all of these questions that uh, were circulated to members of the commission. Um, so I think we have done our work. Um, David, David. Yeah. I mean, can I interrupt for just with one other point? Yep. Going back to question one, and the, the only re the reason I bring this up is I think we handled it a little bit differently than some of the other questions. Um, and of course, you recall it's you know keeping the partisan election. Um, but for the other questions, we acknowledge that there might be some changes. Uh, and in looking at the list, uh, I think that. Uh, at least there, that's not a consensus, there would be a uh, inclusion of uh, at least saying that a member of the members uh, like the designation of incumbency. I would tell you just personally, I like the idea of a retention election, but my only point in that is that I, in my mind anyway, when we voted for number one, um, it wasn't to keep things exactly as they are now um, and, and at least allowed for the possibility of some of the uh, subparts that you have in there. I don't know if other people felt that way, but in other uh, of these questions, we did allow for that possibility. Okay, thank you, Lynn. Okay, um, I think basically what we've been asked to do has been done. Uh, we'll make the changes in our final report. It's going to require a little bit of a hard audit, uh, hard edit rather. That'll be uh, done. We will incorporate uh, the votes uh, and the recommendations that we've discussed this morning in our final report. The final report will be circulated so that everybody has another opportunity to say, no, this, that's not what happened or this language is not what I agreed to and so on and so forth. Because I want to make sure everybody is on board uh, with at least our final report that it accurately sets forth the work of the commission. And then, um, uh, I, I guess, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. May I ask a process question? 
I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. I just want to make sure I understand the process and how the report will be produced. Clearly, the vote was kind of close, but I guess the majority ruled in a way uh, that some of us strongly disagree with. So when the report is written, um, is it going to be written as because that's what the majority voted for? This is what we this is what this commission and I understand if you get the most votes, you get the most votes, you win. I get it. But if that's the case, then I feel like there may be others on this call who do not want to sign the report, don't want to sign off on the report and would probably submit our uh, be, we'll be submitting our own letter with our own thoughts. So I just want to make that clear because I want to make sure that my name is not associated with, not that I respect everyone's opinion, but that my opinions were different and I want that to be duly noted. I'm just concerned about how that, because it because different chairmen handle their reports in a different way. Uh, in the legislature, we generally have a signature line for each participant. And then if you don't sign it, then you have sent a signal that you have not signed off on that report. And, but it's your call, of course, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, I, and I'll abide by your rule. Yeah, I, I think that what I'd like to do is to have uh, everybody sign it if they can. If they're unwilling to sign it, then you can submit a separate letter expressing your views. Uh, we can attach it to the report. Uh, there's nothing to prevent us from doing that. But the way I envision our report being finalized, um, you know, I think it's a little misleading for us to say that the commission adopted such and such if the vote's eight seven. Uh, I think we've got to pretty much dictate what the vote is, just, just so it's clear that uh, not everybody agreed with some of the things uh, that we have recommending, whereas a, a, a large number of the commissioners agreed with other things. So I think we're gonna set forth exactly what the vote was. That's my inclination. So that everybody knows uh, you know, what they're agreeing to and what they're not. Everybody a, voted yes on something. I have uh, a suggestion. Sure, Senator Nichols. Uh, you know, if you put the report together, list the votes, but list who voted how. I would like to be shown on record as voting for or against or whatever I voted. And you can't really just get that with an eight to seven uh, answer. Yeah. And so if you'll list who voted how on each of those questions, I feel fine signing it. Okay, and we'll do that. I think that's a fair point. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Senator Birdwell. Thank you, sir. I, I concur with, with Senator Huffman, and Senator uh, uh, Nichols, because I, I will put my signature on something that accurately reflects what the commission did. But if there are, particularly as, as this report will get out to constituents, if it's not as granular as what Senator Nichols just recommended, then I wanna be able to put either my own letter or reclama or whatever the, the proper terminology is, uh, because these are policy positions that, that we have taken for which we're accountable. And like Senator Huffman said, if I was on the losing side of one, which I, I think there was one, maybe two, uh, that I was on the losing side of. I mm -hmm. want to make sure that people know uh, accurately where I am and from a policy position. Understood. Understood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, I, again, I, I, in, in conclusion, I, I really want to thank all of you uh, for all of your hard work and effort and dedication. I know we spent a lot of time. You've spent a lot of time on it. You've had your staff uh, spend time on it. And I really want to thank you. Uh, I think we've, we've done our job. Uh, we'll submit our report. Uh, uh, and then it, it's all up to the legislature to decide what, if anything, it's going to do. And I also uh, want to conclude by thanking Megan. Uh, Megan has been absolutely terrific. Uh, whenever I make a request, I mean, she responds and responds quickly. Uh, so Megan, on behalf of all of us, thank you so very much. And we don't even need to call the roll to determine whether everybody's in favor of that or not. Second. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> All right. Anything else uh, that needs to come before the commission before we adjourn? If not, we are adjourned. Thank you all so much. Bye. All right. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman.